Good evening, and welcome to the Thursday, January 5th, 2017 meeting of the school committee. If you would all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I am going to run through our agenda because we have one um, change to it and then we will get started. So tonight we will start off with recognitions, if there are any, and um, our first opportunity for public comment and then we will move on to reports to the school committee which will be from student council, our athletic field subcommittee, the new, um, sorry, the MSBA update, the liaison reports, our school committee chair report, the <coughs> superintendent's report, and then we'll move on to new business. Um, and under new business is where we have a change to our agenda as we will have our special town meeting warrant article which is listed in the agenda, but we will not have any budget transfers this evening. So item number B will be deleted from our agenda this evening. Um, and we'll move on to capital projects, school department article 17-042. We have a request for endorsement of the town charter. We have a school committee policy to review, an intent to travel for a field trip request to review. And under old business, um, review of the community access to the athletic center. And then we have our second opportunity for public comment this evening and then items by consensus. So at this time, Dr. McLeod, do we have any recognitions this evening? We do not have any recognitions. Well, I don't. I don't know if anybody else does. Other than Happy New Year. <laughs> um, okay, so we have our first opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak this evening? Okay. Um, we will move on to the reports to the school committee, and we do have our student council representatives with and us this evening. they're there, ready yes. to go. And tonight we have Ryan Brand back. Yep. Welcome, Ryan. And Sarah Durr. Thank you both for being here. No problem. Um, over the past couple weeks, it's been... Uh, not slow at HHS, but I guess coming back from break, um, it was nice to dust off the books on Monday and then get back at it on Tuesday. Um, I know one thing we talked about last time was the use of the HCA um, for our purposes, and I know Sarah and I are both in the same creative writing class, and tomorrow we're actually going over to the HCA. We have a guest speaker who's a, um, I think, creative story writer and... Musician. musician and he does a lot with writing and music combining the two so it's an, just another nice space to have aside from the auditorium um, to have somebody speak and use a different atmosphere um, which is very exciting um, I know one thing I can see we're going to be talking about it but just from a student's perspective knowing that we do have this field committee and knowing that we are taking the initiative um, it's really awesome as students I know Sarah and I are both student athletes and we both played soccer this fall so it's, um, it, it's awesome to know that, that we are making headway on that, and that's awesome. Um, another thing uh, I know we talked about last time is the switch from iPass to PowerSchool. Um, and on Tuesday the 10th and then Wednesday the 11th, there are parent forums. Um, and I think just for anybody, really, for a general use on how to use PowerSchool, because I know it's kind of a big switch for some. Um, and then another thing, we have our, we're hosting our second robotics tournament on January the 14th, um, which we're very excited about, because that's pretty awesome and different this year, something new. We're hosting. Yeah. So how many other districts? I don't really know, to be okay. honest with you. I know, I mean, I know last time we had 24 other teams, so and I think this one's even bigger. Wow. Um, I'm not certain as to how big this one is, but... So Mr. Scott is organizing all of this? I believe so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then for MLK Day coming up, our student council um, does a whole student council-wide community service event. And usually we go and help out at the um, Historical Society. But this year, we thought we'd branch out and try something new. So we're in the process of planning that. Um, our next event at the high school is going to be the Hiller Pageant which is a competition that um, junior and senior boys compete in. And it's really funny, and everyone comes and pays to see it. And then um, we, our sports teams are doing extremely well. 
Like, I know girls basketball is doing really well. Boys ice hockey is doing really well. So we hope to continue that momentum forward. Yeah, that's pretty much all we have for this week. Um, but it was a great break, and we're glad to be back here. So, mm -hmm. Ryan, is your sweatshirt significant? Oh, uh, no, yes. My sister goes there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it is, but I, I, I don't know where I'm going yet. Okay. So, yeah. Sent in all the applications. Just thought I'd give you the but, chance. Yeah. Just in case. <laughs> Sarah, what about you? Um, I'm looking to go into occupational therapy program, so I'll probably – end up at either Quinnipiac or Springfield. Excellent. Awesome. Great. Well, exciting times for all of you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you for finding the time to be here tonight. Thank you for having thank us. You, yes. thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And our next uh, guests are here to speak about the Athletic Field Subcommittee Public Forum Overview. Um, so we have Kathy Herville and Sean Boyd. Right. who are here tonight, and I would invite them to come up. Feel free. Come on over. And... Um, I wanted to remind the school committee, obviously, and for the sake of the of the HCAM being here, that um, there's been a lot of work that's taken place um, on the part of the, what, the Athletic Field Committee is what I think the name of it is. Um, and so two school committee members, Jean and John and myself, are all members of that committee. Um, there's been a lot of work that's gone into it. Dee King, our AD, is the chair, as you all know. So tonight is really a preview, um, a brief preview. I've asked Kathy to do it, really an overview of what folks can expect at the more detailed um, public forum that's to take place next Tuesday night. Um, and I have checked in uh, and confirmed that HCAM will be here. Um, but we are looking forward to hearing from you and welcome again, Kathy. Um, and then I know that we're, we've, we were really excited to plan for next Tuesday night as well. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, we're very excited to support the school and we appreciate the opportunity to, to be here um, and to help you through this process. So with that, we're going to roll into um, what we right now are proposing as our public forum presentation. I'm just going to check in. Can you hear her? Now, can you step closer to oh, the microphone, please? Sure, sure. I was trying to keep it flowing right on you. Turn it that way. Um, better? That's better. You got it? Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So um, our intent, obviously, we're going to start off with introductions with um, Kathy um, kind of leading in with where we are as well as with um, <coughs> Deidre King. Um, we're going to introduce the turf field committee members and as well as Sean and myself and um, I believe um, Deidre will give a little bit more introduction. Um, the, the overall agenda, we're going to cover the project history and the feasibility studies, basically, you know, what the committee has done to date and, and why, you know, how we got to where we are. Um, Gale Associates will go through existing conditions, what, you know, what's going on at the fields, um, proposed projects by the phases, um, the schedule that we anticipate at least for phase one. We're going to touch on maintenance and life cycle costs, that seems to always come up. Um, at that point, we'll go into what we call breakout sessions, which will be led by subcommittee members. Um, then we're going to readjourn, kind of talk about next steps, and then let um, the public provide um, or ask questions. So just quick overview, like I said, the project history, the feasibility studies, obviously why we need turf fields. I know Dee's going to hit that home and, you know, points that, you know, seven out of the ten schools in Tri-Valley have turf and things along those lines. Again, kind of hitting on the feasibility studies, the establishment of the athletic field subcommittee, and um, just the numerous meetings that have taken place and the evaluations and all the factors have been considered. Um, we've, um, we were asked, we had a meeting the other day um, to kind of prep, and we're going, planning to have this on um, a big screen to decide more or less a location map. We're going to have it on a board, but kind of have it parallel to the presentation so we have it for reference as necessary. Um, we'll go into existing conditions, again, just kind of telling people the fields that were involved in the feasibility study that they understand where they're at. Um, and I think at this point, we would probably let them know how Field 13 was eliminated based on parking, things along those lines. Next slide. Um, again, hitting on environmental constraints, really just associated this is Field 4 and 5, um, and just summarizing some of the impacts associated with the, um, having some wetlands and permitting and things along those lines. Um, we'll do a summary of the existing track and field. 
um, and um, just basically the specifics, radius, design, you know, what's there today um, and how, you know, issues associated with that. On the next slide, we also hit on the limitations associated with field, with the existing track and field three. Um, I know it's been raised, some questions have been raised to the committee about, you know, why don't we just do field three, you know, the, it's there and um, we'll hit on issues why the, the track radius and size is limiting um, legal type fields or at least recommended field sizes. Um, so we'll hit on that a little bit. Um, then we'll get into more of the nitty gritty of, you know, what's wrong with the existing grass fields, the conditions, the overuse, the compaction, grass can't grow, um, drainage issues, things that, you know, should be fixed and how a turf field would um, improve that. Kind of summarizing all the analyses, feasibility studies, we'd present the, um, the preliminary recommendations of the subcommittee based on all the work to date. Um, starting with phase one, which we're proposing um, turf field four and five, then leading into um, phase two with field three and expanding the track due to the limitations and then hitting on um, future amenity building. So phase one, um, as we said, field four and five, um, we summarize, you know, multi large combined synthetic turf field, you know, with the feasibility of being used for other uses right now we're showing the soccer field and some baseball and softball if you go to the next slide you'll see um, there's some community opportunities this is just an example of how the community might use it for a youth soccer tournament things along those lines to hopefully obviously community involvement and possibly revenue um, we'd also go into the details um, of phase three um, the de you know the track expanding the track completely to um, allow for the larger fields in its interior, um, what that involves, the need for a, rain, a retaining wall due to the grades out in that area, and obviously summarizing costs. This is just some examples of amenity buildings that we've done in the past. Um, with the track and field project, enlarging the, the track and the, the doing the field in that location, we've got some new bleachers proposed. It's gonna kick in the plumbing code which is gonna require restrooms to be constructed. Um, again, these are just showing some examples of ones we've done in other places, but um, some towns have allowed us to build the fields and then get like a temporary occupancy permit to allow the restrooms to come a little later down the road. Um, those are things we'll have to work out, but also keeping in mind um, these buildings can be used for storage, concession, um, ticketing, you know, those are things we'll plan as it moves forward. Um, we're going to hit on the typical project schedule for turf installation, um, hopefully with the funding in May, approval through the town. Um, basically, our first couple months, we do all the site survey, um, soil investigations, all the things we need to design the field. We go into schematic design, working with the school, with the programming, what do they need, what do they want. Um, to final design, usually we do permitting um, through the winter months to get it all ready bid documents early spring and to be ready to go. Most of our projects run, you know, June as soon as we can have the fields and the events are done. And then we hope to, you know, we always push to have them open, you know, September doesn't always happen that way, but that's, that's always the goal so that they're there and waiting for the fall sports. So, um, next slide. We hit, hit on maintenance and life cycle costs. We've just given some comparison of kind of a, a grass field versus a turf field. We tend to always get that comment, why not grass fields and um, hitting on costs, but also um, we'll get into a little detail on um, the overuse of grass fields and how um, the uses, the number of uses that the school requires between all the teams. You know, you got women, men, practices, phys ed classes that um, kick all that, the need for the turf and how it allows um, the increase in uses. Um, we just included a couple pictures of things that are of projects we've done that are similar to what we're proposing. Um, looking at the far right corner, lower right corner, you can see how that field's kind of bumped out. That would allow like the baseball area. So this field could be used for baseball or softball as well as soccer. Um, yeah, all turf, um, but you can you know paint it, stripe it, you know to whatever. Again, we'll get input from the 
you know, the community as well as the school and the, uh, the users and, you know, figure out what works best. Which, and then this is kind of, um, this project we did out in Triton, which is very similar to what we'd be proposing at the track expen expansion. It includes a retaining wall, which runs along that, um, that right edge. Um, it also had an amenity building, the brand new turf field. Um, Sean was the proud project manager on this beauty, but very, very similar to yours and, you know, it, a little complicated, so. With that, as I said, after kind of our general presentation, we'd break up into the, um, the sessions for about 20 minutes, I think is what we were discussing. Um, and, it, and these sessions would be run by the, the, um, the subcommittees. We, Sean and myself, would be there to support whichever groups, you know, need some help and um, probably with more focus on natural turf and synthetic turf. But. And then we'd re-adjourn, discuss next steps. Um, I know they're looking to set up a website for public um, comment, um, incorporate comments from the public, um, conduct a second public forum, hopefully to, that we incorporate as many comments as possible and feasible, and um, then move on to town meeting. And so, Kathy, just to clarify in terms of the, the, where we are to, to date and the purpose of the forum, is to generate public input and that the proposals around the recommendations are simply the work of the committee to date right. um, as opposed to any kind of vote that's been taken we really are the beginnings and and are, are seeking input and and questions through right. both the, the form and the survey correct right yeah <coughs> anyone have any questions comments I just questions? noted one thing which I uh, which occurred to me today, I had a conversation with um, the Parks and Rec Director, and one thing that I think that we need to make sure we add in is snow removal on the turf field yep. um, for the spring usage. I know often that's necessary, and certainly if we're going to be doing rentals and whatnot. So I think yep. we did not account for that in the maintenance um, slide. Yeah. You don't. No problem. All right, and then just questions, that'd be it. So. Very good. It's been widely advertised. Oh, We're yeah. For a great turnout. I'm <laughs> seeing it everywhere. <laughs> Next Tuesday in the auditorium. That's right. Everybody Tennis come and bring a date. <laughs> <laughs> the auditorium here? Yes. Yep. All right. Well, thank right. you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. You're far more heavy on the reports today than yes. normal. Um, next, we have our new building enrollment projections and MSBA update with both Dr. McLeod and uh, Mr. Jeff D'Amico. And um, if I could just, in your packet tonight, um, and the packet obviously that was, was posted, is the NESDEC projections. Um, and I, I reached out kind of on a whim and was delighted that uh, Don Kennedy was able to be here tonight to speak oh, to it for us. Um, and so, because initially I was going to try, but um, he, was, he was able to come. Um, and if I may invite him up to speak Absolutely. to this first. So Don um, and Ms. DeBeau, this Please. would be a great time for you to join us. Um, you have this information in front of you. And if there's anybody out there that would like a copy, there are copies right here at the end of the table. Jonathan, thank you. You could pass them out. Super. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I'm just one of the warm-up bands tonight, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be uh, as quick and as focused as I can uh, on particularly grades K and 1, because I know you've got some decisions to be made. Yes, thank you, uh, Don. I, I uh, would, would like to walk you through these four pages uh, and just try to do it without any questions and then take questions, all the questions at the end, if that's okay. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, on, on the first page, let, let me just quickly acquaint you with, with the charts. Uh, the, the three uh, vertical uh, blue columns uh, have the same years. so. The, the top row looks back 10 years into the past, and the bottom row is the current school year, 16-17. And this is for the whole district, uh, grade by grade, 
uh, up here, and then there's some grade groupings of uh, collections of, of grades that you use, and we're particularly interested down in this corner, uh, the, the K through one. And if you have sharp eyes, you will see, and, and if you had the time to look, to look at this, uh, I grew up on a main island, so I, I think in terms of ocean metaphors, and although we do your projections every year, you've had a sea change. <laughs> now, sea changes don't come all at once, and they come with little trickles at a time that you may not notice, and the sand castle that you were building on the beach uh, doesn't get washed away at, at the beginning. It, it happens incrementally, and you may not notice that the ocean is beginning to, to change. But if you look down in this corner in K through 1, and you look at the year 2012-13, uh, you'll notice that not only is that the lowest number in that yellow column, but it also, the, the numbers have begun to go up since that time. And I'm going to refer back to that approximate point, because that's when the little trickles began to come. And at the time, we talked about it, but we didn't know what necessarily was going to happen. Is it going to be the same as it has been, because it's been sort of in and out, in and out, uh, and pretty flat enrollment o over the last uh, almost 20 years? Uh, or is it going to, to begin to change? But we now see that as one tidbit of evidence uh, of, of the sea change which has occurred. If you go to the second page, this is set up in the same format, but it starts with the current year. So we were looking in the rearview mirror at 10 years of the past on page one. Now on page two, we're looking forward. So the top column is the current year, 2016-17, and then the next 10 years are 10 years into the future that haven't yet occurred. And there's similar groupings uh, to what we had uh, b before of the grade level groups. And as you can see in this lower uh, left-hand column, uh, the, the K to 1, which uh, right now is 450, we think is going to go into the high 400s and just keep gradually going up, up, up. And it looks like the, uh, the tide is, is coming up the beach and has uh, since 2012. And we believe it's going to continue to, to do that. Uh, if you're interested in how these are constructed, you can notice that uh, if, if you, you pick any spot on the, the chart, uh, I'll, I'll just pick the current uh, kindergarten group this year, uh, which was uh, 224 uh, as, as of October 1st. Uh, that, we believe, is going to grow to 252 uh, by next year in first grade because you have always had uh, 7 to 14 percent increases from kindergarten to first grade. So you'll notice that uh, all of these uh, first grade numbers uh, to the lower right of the attached kindergarten that they came from uh, are all slightly larger than the group was in yeah. kindergarten because a few more uh, have moved in. Uh, when you go from eighth grade to ninth grade, you'll notice that those numbers decline slightly. And if you think about it, at the end of eighth grade, there are a lot of choices. You could go to your local public high school, but you also could leave and go to a parochial high school. You could go to uh, an independent high school. You could go to a vocational school, uh, four, five, six. Traditionally, from eighth grade here, do go to a vocational school for ninth grade. So it, it, it isn't always a plus, necessarily, in going from one grade to the next. But we try to. Uh, account for the fact that when we look at 10 years worth of history, we like to see what happens in a particular grade, and does that grade typically grow or, sh or, uh, or shrink, and what's it been doing recently? And that's how we do the, the projections. So we make lots of choices in the formulas that we put into the, the computer, but they're all based on the recent history of, of the district. 
If you look at number three, page three, uh, this shows you uh, with the, the blue line with the diamonds uh, are the births, uh, the, the Hopkinton births or, or births to residents of Hopkinton. Uh, and this starts uh, back in 2001 and those were students who then showed up in kindergarten five years later in 2006. So it matches the 2006 year that we started with when we did the history here. And you'll see that in the 2006 year, the exact same number of students showed up in kindergarten five years later, e exactly equal to the total of the number of Hopkinton births. Uh, in fact, that number has wavered a lot over the years, and usually the, the kindergarten has been about 5% larger than the number of births five years before, because there, there usually have been uh, enough net move-ins so that more people moved in than moved out, and so usually if 100 children were born to residents of Hopkinton, about 105 or 107 would show up in kindergarten. The ratio you're getting now, instead of 105 or 107, you've never ever got before, or at least in the 40 years that we've been doing your projections. And instead of getting 105 or 107, you're getting about 180 now. So the tide is definitely coming up the beach. And let's again uh, think, of that 2012 year that I mentioned before where, where the tide began to turn and the numbers began to increase in grades uh, K and 1. And if you look right here, uh, here's a year where almost the same exact number showed up in kindergarten uh, as had been born five years before, and that's the fall of 2011. Here's the fall of 2012, and this number, the kindergartners right here, are actually births plus 34. That had never happened before, except once. Uh, this was a premonition a, a couple of years before that. Uh, that was a plus 49, but here's plus 34, plus 54, plus 83, plus 88, plus 100. So this, this year's kindergarten, uh, 224 students showed up for kindergarten, but five years before, only 124 had been born to parents yeah. of Hopkinton, yeah. who, who, who lived in Hopkinton. So this is now a full flood tide, and you're getting uh, what we think will, will be uh, as potentially as many as 100 move-ins every year for the next 10 years. You, we know that from some real estate information, uh, but whatever would be the number of births, you're now in a mode where you're going to get record numbers of kids showing up five years later in, in kindergarten and we know what the, what the births are, so we can project this forward. If you look at the last page, uh, number four, uh, I'm particularly interested, I'm, I'm going to ignore some of this other information, but I'm particularly interested in the upper left-hand box. Uh, if you talk regularly with uh, Jennifer Burke, the town planner, or the, the planning department, uh, or, or you have a friend who's a realtor who will talk to you about uh, not only legacy farms but but all the other projects that are that are going on because le legacy is not the only one. Uh, you're you're now getting a record number of uh, real estate sales. You're well out of the 2008 recession. It took different communities, different uh, patterns. Of, of growing beyond the recession, but you're way beyond it now. And 
I don't know if you are particularly interested in, in numbers, but if you have a pen or pencil and, and you're interested, uh, to the left-hand side of this top box, you might write uh, the number the number 230, and then drop down to where it says 2012 and write 136, and then down at the bottom write uh, 230 to 240. The 230 is, is the average number for about a five-year span that the number of single-family homes that was selling in Hopkinton before the recession. And then on the line where you, you wrote in the, uh, the 136, that's the smallest number of homes that was sold during the recession. And that's a number which is only 59% of the number that, that you wrote in this, this top box, the, the 230 that were being sold dropped to 136. Now you're back into the 230, 240 range. So you're, you're back selling the number of homes that you were before the recession. Not only are the numbers higher, but the, the prices are higher. The fact that the prices are now higher than they were before the recession means that the 10,000 baby boomers a day who are turning 65 have no reason any longer to keep their homes on the market waiting for the prices to get better because the prices already have gotten better and they're now up in the price range that's higher than what it was before the recession. And this is the first time that that's happened. So a lot of, a lot of people who are thinking of retiring and uh, downsizing have decided because of the recession to hold on to their properties. That's no longer the case. So if people do decide to put their homes on the market, there are a lot of properties being built in Hopkinton that would allow a baby boomer to downsize into a smaller property but still stay in the community. On the other hand, that if they do make that choice, that makes their three or four or five bedroom home available, and guess who's going to buy that? Because the quality of education that you're providing is something that is causing people to want to buy homes in Hopkinton as opposed to someplace else. And that, that's one of the reasons why you're getting so many move-ins. That's one of the reasons why your numbers are going up. Uh, you've done full day kindergarten, you've done free transportation. Uh, so th there's lots of reasons if I'm thinking of moving to this area to want to be in Hopkinton as opposed to, to someplace else. You, you have good conservation and recreation as well as schools, but, but uh, there's lots of reasons to want to come here and people are voting with their pocketbooks and, and they are coming here. Uh, where it says multi-units, uh, let's assume, let's, let's just assume that these are all condos. They're not all condos. Some are, are rentals, whatever. But uh, if you were jotting down numbers in the left-hand column, you might want to jot down here uh, 44 up in this, n next to this uh, 2005 line. That, that's how many uh, condos were being sold a year in Hopkinton before the recession. Then drop down a couple lines and write in 31. That's how many were being sold during the recession, uh, which is about 70% of the, the pace uh, before. And then uh, down at the bottom, uh, write 130, because that's how many are being sold now which is w way uh, higher than the 44 per year that were being sold before the recession. So you're, you're now doing uh, about 130 condos a year uh, in sales in addition to the 230 to 240 single family homes. So I've crammed a lot of data uh, 
into the last seven or eight minutes, and I'd be happy to answer questions. But I guess the one last thing I'd like to mention is that there's another way of looking inside the numbers. And if you went back to uh, the first two charts uh, with the, the historical and the, uh, the projections, uh, one of the things that's interesting, if you look inside the numbers, is that in grades one through eight, if you look all over the country at all school districts, grades one through eight tend to be the most stable in numbers. People who get their kids into first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, usually try to stay there for a while and not move to someplace else. Now they might have to move for, for financial reasons, for, for career reasons, whatever, but, but they will usually try to stay in place. So if you had in grades one through seven, uh, 1,700 kids last year, then in grades two through eight the next year, you'd probably have about 1,700 because that probably wouldn't change. Now, if the number shrank, you're probably losing kids someplace and you've got a hole in the boat and you, you would want to see where are they going to and why are, why are they leaving here. If it rises, then you, you may not have noticed it, but your enrollment in grades one through eight, which, which usually would be stable, could be rising. And in fact, uh, since 2012, the year that we said there were additional kindergartners and first grade graders coming into the district, since that year, the hidden number uh, has been a plus 44 have snuck into grades one through eight in addition to the kindergartners who were coming in new. In this fall, for example, there are 1,857 students in grades two through eight, but that 1,857 came from a group of only 1,799 last year in grades one through seven. So that, that group grew by 58 and you hardly noticed it because there were a sprinkling in this grade, that grade, the other grade. So it, it isn't <coughs> only in kindergarten, although we can spot that quite easily by checking out the number of births and then seeing who enters the school system the next year, or the, the five years later in, in, in kindergarten. So. That that's, in a nutshell, uh, what could be a whole series of lectures on Hopkinton demography. But in, in any event, we're absolutely confident that you've had a sea change. People want to be here. If you create it or build it, they will come. They have come. They are coming. Talk to the planning board, and they'll tell you all the proposed projects that they have on the drawing boards. Things don't just get proposed by uh, builders uh, for, for the whim of it because they have to put up their money. So they have reason to believe that they can sell those properties. And they wouldn't be telling you that places are under construction or our construction is planned two years, three years in advance if they didn't have a high expectation <coughs> that uh, somebody is going to want to buy those properties. You're doing the right things, you're getting the kids, and the tide's been coming in little by little, little bit up the beach uh, for the last five years. And now we ha see enough different signs to be able to say that this isn't going to change for a while. Th this is going to continue. Don, before you finish, um, and something that you called out in your, in your narrative, in yes. your report, was you, you know the highest projected number we see K-1 in the first five years is 495. Right. And when the next part of this report is going to be about class size and enrollment projections, um, can you just comment on the next five, like the years five through 10, and how accurate that might be with your crystal ball? <coughs> or okay. because we see 495 as being the largest number, mm -hmm. do you think, based on everything you just said mm -hmm. tonight, 
that we could expect that 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 number could grow? That, that's a hard question to, to answer. Uh, when, if, if you think of the weather forecasts that you see on TV, and let, let's say a tropical storm is in the Caribbean and it's going to come up the, the East Coast, you'll see what the Weather Bureau calls a cone of uncertainty, and they will show you in six hours, 10 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, this is where we think the center of the storm is going to be. Right. And you'll notice that as, as it gets farther into the future, away from the time that the forecaster is talking, the path, the potential path widens and it grows out and there's a growing cone of uncertainty five or six days out, whereas if you're only talking a few hours out, they'll say, no, it's going to be within 10 miles of here or whatever. Uh, so the same is true for enrollment projections. So in the first three to five years, uh, we're pretty certain what the numbers will be. They may be a little higher, they may be a little lower, but they usually will come within 1% of the number that we've projected. So if you're talking three years out, we could be 3% too high, we could be 3% too low. If you're talking 10 years out, we could be 10% too high or 10% too low. And the reason for that is that, that as you go into the future, factors are going to change. The number of births will go up or down. The economy will be different. The uh, uh, mortgage rate will change, so more people will want to refinance their existing houses or people will want to go to other ones. The jobs will change, all, all sorts of things. Uh, so it, it's really hard to answer your uh, question specifically, but I think that probably more than, than almost any community that I've studied, uh, and we do about 400 of these sets of projections a year, and we do it every year. And, and of all the communities that I can think of, uh, I don't know of, of another one uh, other than Hopkinton in, in New England that has uh, more planned uh, building units on, in, in the planning pipeline uh, as a percentage of the whole community. Uh, and, and he, Buddy who has it more than you do, and you you've got the jobs, you've got the transportation, you know you've got the infrastructure and the access to to all kinds of employment. Uh, people who live in Hopkinton don't have to depend on Worcester, they don't have to depend on Boston, they don't have to depend on 495. There are lots of different directions they can go. Some of them can work in Rhode Island. There, it, it's so easy to get from Hopkinton to a lot of different places that you potentially have access to a gigantic employment uh, set of opportunities. So you're not, it isn't like being in, uh, you know, on, on the coastline and, you know, electric boat is the only show in town or electric boat and Pfizer are, uh, you know, em employ, you know, 50% of the people in the community. And if those two uh, businesses are having difficulties, then the community is, is going to be flat. Uh, you're not in that situation at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think it's very likely that the positive, you know, unless, <coughs> unless there's another worldwide recession like the, the 2008 recession, uh, I, I think the fact that, that all over the, the world, the, the leaders are focusing on their economies and their trading partners and, and are, are that, that seems to be such a hot topic with voters that I can't imagine that people aren't going to uh, follow through on that. And, uh, and I wouldn't see any reason that the housing market would cool off in, in Hopkinton. Thank you. Great. I, mean, that's, I think it's as sure as you, as you ever can be. Yeah. Appreciate it. Did anyone have any questions or comments about what we just heard? Just a really quick question, and I'm sure the answer is yes, but these 
forward-looking projections include the full build-out of Legacy Farms? Yes. As well as this new Hopkinton Muse. Muse. Right. It's, it's marketed <coughs> under something else. Right. Whatever, it, it, it anticipates okay. that that continues. Okay. I, I don't. I don't think that the hot market is going to get that much hotter. But I think the pace, which is very rapid now, at which homes are selling, uh, is going to continue for for a long time. Uh, Zillow, the online uh, real estate uh, firm, uh, says that the eastern part of Massachusetts, the the Boston area that you're in, uh, <coughs> is one of the ten hottest real estate markets in America, and they're not predicting that that it's that it's going to drop out of the the top ten you know, at, at any point. So uh, this hasn't happened. You know, I, I've, I've been a Massachusetts school administrator or doing the NESDAQ work that I'm doing uh, since 1965, and I've not seen as strong um, an economic real estate market uh, in that length of time uh, that we have right now. And the prediction is it's going to continue. One just comment, because I was looking at these numbers, and, and we've looked at them a number of times, and I think the one anomaly that we keep seeing that we keep expecting to change that doesn't is the growth from K to 1, because we expected when we went with full-day kindergarten that we'd have less growth because mm -hmm. people weren't keeping their kids in private kindergarten. And what occurred to me sitting here trying to figure out why that hasn't changed is these are point in time numbers, right? So these are October 1st mm -hmm. enrollments. And mm -hmm. what we see every year is it's actually the growth probably isn't between October 1st kindergarten and October 1st first grade. It's all the kids that come into kindergarten throughout the year. I mean, you end right. up with. And even this past summer, we yeah. welcomed 61 new families over the summer. Right, but even, so right. so from September yeah. 1st on, though, I know you, right. you get a lot of Absolutely. kids during we the year, too, which, <laughs> so don't, so they don't show up in the kindergarten number, uh, but they do correct. show up in the first grade number. So they're not a new first grader, but for purposes of these, they are. I know that that, yes, that, that can increase true. it, too. So I think we often think about people moving here before the year starts right. to get their child into kindergarten without realizing how many people Mm -hmm. For whatever Throughout reason, move in during the year, and I know just from my own experience that, that a lot of my kids will have one, two additional kids added to their class throughout the year. So that speaks to I think some of the growth that we see here too. True. Yeah, you're you're right on target. I think if if the 2008 recession was still gripping the whole nation, including Hopkinton, then when you switch to uh, full day kindergarten, you, you would have gotten pretty much the same numbers in first grade the next year that you got in kindergarten the year before. But but because you're getting additional move-ins throughout the kindergarten year and, and also into first grade, that, that I think you're right. That's, that's where they're coming from. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Don, again, thank you for coming on such short notice thank and providing so such sure. an in-depth okay. report. It's been very, very, very helpful. Okay. Well, that, thank, thank you. And I hope that you do end up with whatever space you calculate that you need because there is a clear connection between uh, class size and space availability uh, and what teachers are able to deliver for kids in, in the classroom. And you, you know that. And so <laughs> step one is to know how many kids, and then step two is to get the space for them. That's right. Thank you. There's a like connection. Good segue. Thank you for that comment. That was perfect. I didn't ask him to say that. I did not. <laughs> I'm going to invite Jeff up now. Okay. Jeff, do you want to join us? I will, but if you don't mind joining us, that'd be great. And Mr. Bo is here. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Thank Don. I was just going to begin, if that's okay, and then and then Jeff sure. was going to add in. Um, so in your packet, I had summarized just basically just some really quick trends um, that that Jeff and I had been speaking about. So I'll just comment on that briefly, which was um, in terms of timeline. In spring of 2014, the MSBA in the town agreed to a school enrollment of 355 students, um, and that was based on all of our all of the information that we had at that at that time it, the following fall we opened to 435 students and with the leadership of the ESBC and compass management um, 
worked with the MSBA to have them agree to increasing our enrollment from the original 355 to 395, which we were delighted with. It meant that we were going to have an additional two classrooms, um, and we were able to maintain our timeline and work with the MSBA. Um, then, so in the fall of 2016, the architect completed the design and the bid project to the construction manager, manager, um, and we're in the middle of that as well uh, right now, as we know. So the conversation that happened tonight with Don, and, and again, it was great that he could come here, was based on just what we got from him in November. And as a result of this, not only the increased projections, but a very different story than we've been telling. Um, and that even just most recently at the CIC meeting, people on at that meeting unaware that this story of flat enrollment across the district had significantly changed. And we felt, the school committee, myself and the school committee felt, that it was really important that we widely communicate this information. Um, that as we can see, we just received in November. And it felt that the timing with the project um, was at least just, let's just have the conversation, not expecting really that anything could come of it, but let's, um, let's see what it would mean. Um, and so I've created this chart that I just wanted to speak to um, because as Don set up so nicely for me, what this is about when we think about the, um, the strategic initiative that has long been part of the strategic plan in Hopkinton is around uh, the importance of class size. And, and Lauren will, will reinforce, I know, that there's nowhere that class size matters more than in kindergarten and first grade. We care about it right through elementary um, and the research would would support maintaining class size around 20 definitely under at k1 we don't have that kind of research at the higher levels but we definitely have it at the lower levels and we know that it matters we know that what matters is that all kids are reading by third grade um, so the class size really matters in k1 and so the chart in front of you really looks at the fact that in 2017-18 we can't do anything about class size because of the constraints of the building. Um, and you can see that we're already well above where we would like to be um, with numbers around 23. And this is an average, so that Lauren, I mean, some of your yeah. classes would have more and some would have, have less. Absolutely. We do have um, two kindergarten classrooms currently at 24. Yeah. Um, so, but then what I did is I thought, well, let's look at what it would mean when we open the school in 2018 if we have the current configuration, which is 11 and 11, 11 classrooms of each. And I simply took Don's numbers and um, put them in as, here's what it would look like, class size of 19.8, close to 20, and 23 in first grade with the current configuration, not using the swing space. So not using the health room or the art room that as part of the project were always intended to be there in case of that odd year where we needed an additional classroom. Um, but we've worked hard, Lauren and I, with the MSBA on the educational program. Um, and, and we know that this is very important, that the educational program not be compromised through the project. So we understood that, you know, if we needed a flex space for an odd bubble year where we had something unanticipated, we would always have that space to use. Um, but using that as a long-term solution was never the intent. Um, if we look at having adding two more classrooms, then we're looking for opening in 2018 at 18 to a classroom, but still 21 in first grade. And that's with the current projection. So you've heard Don say, and we know that the history is, that there's going to be 1% to 2% more than even what the numbers are telling us in front of us. Um, if we added four more classrooms, then we'd be getting much closer to where we'd like to be. In fact, it's looking at only 17, 16.7 at kindergarten. Again, um, without accounting for the move-ins that we get throughout the summer as well as throughout the year. Um, but then we have a really nice class size of 19. I took this out as far as 2021 only because that was the highest number that I just asked um, Don the question on. So that highest number of 495 is in 2021. And so if we look at the highest number that's predicted through NASDAQ, um, if we had four additional classrooms, we would have our desired classroom size. We would have 17.8 in kindergarten and 20 
in first grade. Um, if we, in the current configuration of the building with only 11, 11 of each, we would be opening, I mean, sorry, by our largest number predicted to date, we would already be at 21 in kindergarten and almost 24 in first grade. So I wanted to um, bring that information to the attention of the school committee tonight um, as we really are working with looking at your direction on where we need to go in terms of our work with the ESBC, um, as well as the fact that we know that there's a special town meeting which the warrant closes tomorrow. Um, and so I invited Jeff to be here tonight to answer any questions on specifics um, from his perspective. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it back to you, Lori. Okay. Um, thanks for joining us, Jeff. Did, I, I mean, I know that some have some information that they've already had and some this is brand new. Um, so if you have any questions or comments that you want to ask Jeff, feel free. Um, if not, I can help kick it off, but. Well, I guess, are you going to give us your recommendations about <coughs> what, how, how you recommend Well, Jeff can this, speak to some history of what's taken place over the past couple of weeks. Okay. I think that would be helpful. If okay. you talk about the conversations that we've the conversations had, as well that have been some taken of the place. conversations yeah. with the MSBA, I think would be good. Sure. Yep. So, um, you know, Kathy had shared with us this uh, chart that she shared with you and that um, currently, when we started the process two years ago with this with your committee, uh, your ideal classroom size, as you know, it was 18 for the kindergarten age group and then up to 20 for first grade. And so initially with the 395 students uh, that you were enrolled in and you had 11 classrooms, that would work. But over time, the past few years, you've continually grown to the point where if you're projected to be over that 480 number, it starts to get to the more uncomfortable numbers that she's showing you here of 23 or 24 students in a classroom. So the, the question was asked, what could be done, and is there time to do anything? Um, and so we looked at what it would look like to have an addition on the, onto the building that we're building now. As part of the process, at the beginning, we've always earmarked at the end of the classroom ring the potential for a four or eight classroom addition in terms of physical footprint that's available before you get to the woods. Um, so based on the projections of where you're going now, to get back to the desirable um, enrollment that the town is looking for, you'd look for a four classroom addition, which would be two kindergartens and two on the first floor be stacked. So one silo, if you will, of classrooms added on to the classroom wing. As far as timing goes, um, obviously we're into construction, but we're still early enough in where we potentially could incorporate and dovetail in a quick change in the project. Uh, if that was the desire of the town. Certainly this is not something that the MSBA normally goes through, and so this would be a learning curve on their end too. We'd have to sit down and have a discussion about it. So we've reached out to them uh, in December, early December, when uh, Lauren first brought the new projections to us about what's possible and can we get a meeting. So in the meantime, we've been having those dialogues to try and schedule a meeting to have members of the school committee in town, if it is your decision to move forward with is an addition possible and can we still do it within the time frame of this project as far as uh, that goes you have your special town meeting in January and the good news is that we've only started pouring foundations uh, at the beginning of December so if we were to move quickly uh, with both the town side and with the MSBA side it is possible that the addition could catch up um, to the start of the construction if we act before the end of January and move forward um, obviously waiting much later would have a would make the addition be more of a true addition versus a dovetail where you're naturally flowing through in terms of the construction if it was a true addition you'd have to come back afterwards and remobilize with your concrete and your site contractors and your steel and so that would have a different cost ramification as opposed to dovetailing it in as you're getting to that stage of the natural progression of construction and in terms of I mean that makes sense in terms of what you're talking about with cost and not having to call back those various subcontractors in at a later time, but what does it do for the timeline in terms of the opening of the building? So we believe, and granted this is new information, you know, starting uh, last month, that uh, if we were to able to work with, within the confines of the special town meeting that's scheduled for the end of this month, that we'd still be able to deliver the project on time uh, for the September opening of 2020. But does that... Does that assume that, at, what was that? 2019. <laughs> Does that Too many assume that as a result of the special town meeting, money would be immediately available? Because 
as far as I understand it, in order to, and I don't know the, the price that you're talking about, but in order to um, borrow the money, we would first have to have the two-thirds vote at the special town meeting, but also have a ballot, and there is no ballot until May. So there isn't a ballot um, so for an election, unless, to, unless you would have to call a special election. I don't know how, and there are a lot of people a, in the audience that question. know the answer so, to that. Um, but. Let me answer one part, and then we can get to that. So um, the good news is that through the process of the elementary school building committee sh shepherding the project and, a, and the design team, the numbers that we took in in November, which are the bid contracts from all the subs and the general uh, and the construction manager that you hired, the guaranteed maximum price for the project came in two million dollars under the initial budget that was voted on uh, a year and a half ago at town meeting. So there's a capacity within the number of two million dollars and so the, the request that would go for the special town meeting would be the delta of the two million to what it would cost to, to build this addition. And so I, I believe, and that still needs to be vetted out with town council and the, and the town manager, that um, that delta most likely could be handled within the tax levy or the available levy. So that, or that needs to be verified, <laughs> I guess. So, so the, yeah. It needs to be so, verified. So there's, it, Jeff and I were talking about beforehand, there, there's, the, the timing of everything creates both a, I think, a tremendous opportunity for us to potentially solve a problem that has come up, but also creates the fact that we have to do a lot of things concurrently. Yep. So uh, that's an open question that I, we had talked about the need to follow up with uh, Mr. Kamala's office on about what the, the mechanisms that could potentially be available. The, the situation we find ourselves in, though, is that the warrant for that special town meeting also closes tomorrow. So, I mean, this this is sort of probably oversimplifying it, but so it's possible that we could approve potentially a warrant article tonight that we then find out tomorrow through further discussions can't work. Right. But if we do it the other way, unfortunately, based on okay. the timing, if we wait to find out if it can work, then we're past the warrant deadline. So again, if we had more time, we'd like to stretch this out and answer all these questions, but we don't. And again, I, I think that the important thing to, to focus on here is it's possible if that last piece comes together that we've we found ourselves in a tremendous opportunity because the confluence of events of where we are in the construction timeline where special town meeting exists is that we do have an opportunity to solve this problem in a really cost effective um, and and efficient way that also as a side benefit from a cosmetic perspective I was talking to uh, Tim Bonfati and he was mentioning that it'll also look like it was part of the building as opposed to when you do an addition later and it always sort of looks like an addition. It will um, it will help from, from that perspective as well. So it, it's an open question and I, and I know it's Mr. Herr, Mr. Kamalo, it's, in, it's not, are not in a position to answer it tonight, but it's I think a conversation that we need to have about how that can work. Mm -hmm. so. No, and I, I completely agree with you. And I, you know, as I've said multiple times across this project, the last thing any of us wants to do is open a building that's under that's already over capacity. I mean, that's not. We're spending the town is spending a lot of money on this, and that's not the value that they were trying to get. So I, I mean, I'm very much in favor. This, you know, this um, enrollment data. I think I've said this as well is finally catching up to what we're actually experiencing, and which for many years just wasn't really jiving in my mind, at least. So. Um, so I definitely think that this is important, and I think we have a potentially a good opportunity. But you know, obviously, we do need to answer the question of um, whether funding, I, and I don't know the amount of money that you're talking about, but whether that funding would be available. Because if it's not available until May, I presume that that means that either we're knocked off the timeline or we have to do this separately as an addition later. Because what I think we can't do is delay opening by a whole nother year, given how many kids we know are coming in and how crowded they are already. And I just will, will close my long-winded remarks by saying that we did do this exact thing when we opened this building. Um, when this building was built, they already added in the first edition during the process of construction exactly for this reason, because the, um, because the enrollment was increasing so much. Um, because I think, you know, as we just heard, um, and it's, it's not a secret, Hopkinton is a great place to live. And I think, you know, now we can officially say that children have replaced our waterways and natural um, beauty as our, our greatest national, uh, our greatest resource, our greatest natural resource in town because this is why people come here to raise a family. So, um, 
So I think this is really important, but I think we really, it's critical to resolve the issue, obviously, of the funding. But John's right, we can always take it off. We cannot put it on after tomorrow, so I certainly am in favor of doing that. So I have a question. How does the MSBA play into this? I know how hard you guys had to fight to get those additional two classrooms and get them to kind of come around to the, to the number that you landed on. They, they play heavily. Uh, so they're, they're a partner in the process. How will, so they're, they're how, part will the, how will the new enrollment numbers play into the MSBA? Is there that's the, So we're placement? in the process of getting that meeting scheduled. Um, they're okay. corralling all their executives to have the meeting uh, with us. And so we hope to have that um, next week, if not the week after. Uh, but they're clearly well aware of our timeline before town meeting that a resolution needs to occur. And they're going to work with us to, to come up with what that is. Um, this is not something they typically um, deal with, so this will be, you know, a learning curve for their side as well as ours. But they're aware that, for the reasons that were stated by Don, you're not in this position with, that many of your uh, contemporary towns are around you, and that you're actually growing at a, at a faster rate, and so that something uh, more extraordinary needs to be taken into consideration as we go through the process. So. Um, we need to have that discussion with them and, and get their buy-in because they are a partner. We don't want to do anything that would jeopardize the funding that's already uh, been committed to the town, so we can't just plow ahead and, and, and willy-nilly add an addition. They've got to agree to allow the town to That was kind that. of where I was going. So if we say we're doing the addition no matter what you say, that we're not doing that. So. Okay. We're no, getting their buy-in before we continue. We're getting it off Right. If you were to move path. forward with it, I mean, your, your motion or whatever uh, – step you take would be contingent on you know on that. turning it over to the board of selectmen to the building committee and to the msba and coming to a resolution before okay. the special town meeting but to set those steps up which as john noted will all be happening in, uh, in rapid speed in parallel in order to make that deadline work nobody had anything going on in january anyway no. but is it or your expectation yeah sorry is it your expectation that an answer to that question can be um you know resolved by the msba before january 30th Yes. Okay. Sometimes they don't. They're aware that the answer the schedule, is not valued to you guys after okay. that deadline. So just because I'm making sure that I'm hearing this correctly, if if the decision by the MSBA is no, does that just mean that the town's on its own, or that we can't do anything? That's a good question. I don't think it's binary, uh, right? It, it could be one of a few things. I can't answer that yeah. at this time. I mean, typically, um, I can't answer that at this time without having a conversation with them. Yeah. I think Sorry, it was a no, lawyer a question. question. <laughs> but I, I do think, I mean, Jeff, are you comfortable talking about the dollar amount sure. that has been projected? Sure. Could, could you talk about that? Yeah. So, um, so again, just didn't have a lot of time to, to, to get buy-in and build a design, but we've worked with the designers um, this week, and they've chatted with all their sub-consultants in terms of what it would take to upsize. Um, the, the utilities, the infrastructure, things that are already planned in the building, uh, can the existing building handle the capacity, uh, you know, what things do need to be upgraded, as well as obviously the physical footprint of adding uh, 5,500 square feet. So you take two classrooms on each floor with some circulation space, and it comes out to about 5,500 square feet, uh, somewhere between there, and could be 6,000, depending on how everything shakes out. Um, but that square footage, we've had the construction manager price. It hasn't made its way down to all the subs, but we're using uh, conservative numbers at this point because the number I give you today can still come down uh, in January. Um, but it wants to be conservative now to make sure that we're protecting the town to not have a number you can't work with uh, at the end of January. So the number that we're using on the conservative side is $4 million for the full addition, and that would include uh, additional technology, furniture, uh, your consultant fees, and the, and the cost to, to do all the building um, within that number. Out of that $4 million, we still are under budget by the $2 million that we were th that came out of the guaranteed maximum price. So the net number that would go to town meeting is currently $2 million, but that number could be tightened up um, before the end of January. And that's without eating into the project contingency? That's without eating in. Yeah, I mean, you could oh. bleed down other line items, you know, if if, if there was a fine point um, that needed to be gotten to. Um, so, Dr. McLeod, this is actually not a question for Jeff, but we just got through our budget process and we were talking about supplies, teachers, all those things for that coming year, where, you know, and so adding four classrooms is going to be 
four additional teachers. So for the, but not for, not for that budget. It'll be the following budget. Right, for the right. budget that the school yep. building opens. Correct. Um, so yes, that is something that we would have to plan for. Um, and when we get into that, um, Lauren and I have already had discussion around this about, about what that might mean and, and, and how we could um, make some recommendations to be able to budget for that. So um, this is probably not the best time to have that conversation, but, no, but we, have, yeah, um, we have some solutions in mind. Um, and one thing, you know, that is just really critical is if we're, it's very different if you're looking at a class size of 24 versus a class size of 19. Um, in terms of staffing decisions. But those staffing decisions, I mean, I know this is the new school and it's where all of our attention is, but class sizes at all of the other schools are part of that bigger decision You know, there, process, there's more right? flexibility there though, Kelly. Um, and we've had discussions, as you know, for next year's budget where one class size was up significantly but the other was down and it ended up netting out. That happened at Hopkins School two budgets ago and it's happening at the Elmwood School in this budget. So we feel that because we have more sections in those buildings, they can handle more move-ins, right now anyway. Um, so it's definitely the center school where we're, we're most concerned about the additional set, needed additional sections currently. So I, I don't know if you're adding this into your timeline and I assume you are, but <clears throat> we would need to go or somebody building committee or probably building committee would need to go to appropriations to vet this CIC to vet this before the special town meeting um, and you know it would be wonderful if there was time as well for a, a public forum um, so that people because this is happening so quickly and I don't think it's on so people's I, radar screens just before it, they get there it's my understanding that <laughs> if this if this addition portion of it is outside the realm of the elementary school building committee's charge so I think that any of those types of meetings or forums would have to be run by us okay well that's the other thing we have to clarify because I, I believe that the decision was made for the original project that that the money was going to be spent under the direction of the building committee so I don't know. That seems then awkward to have the addition. I, I think it's a. I think it's a decision we have to. So I think. I, so at the moment, I think it's. It's. I mean, this is a school committee decision. I would think it would logically make sense since we're talking about it is part of the same building that we would want to. But my opinion is we want to obviously put it in the charge of the elementary school building committee. I think the issue is, I don't think we can do that. I think we have to ask the board of selectmen to do that because I think that charge is through the Board of Selectmen. And maybe that's part of the conversation yeah. with the MSBA of how that appropriately works. I don't Why do you think it's know. different? What do you mean? Why is the, you know, the, the decision of whether an addition is needed comes yeah. from the school committee, but once the decision is made, I don't know, I don't I know, the, I don't know the charter right. of the, I don't know, I don't know the exact wording of the charter for the elementary school building committee, but whether it was sized for 395 or 450, why does that, differ on their charge for managing the, the project through the completion. Yeah, sometimes when you hear something out loud, it makes more sense, right? <laughs> so you're right, because we're not, I'm thinking, in my head, I'm thinking about this as an addition to the project, but what we're actually doing right now is we're talking about expanding the scope of the building that's already being built. So I, yeah, I think, right. I think you're right. I don't but think I wasn't referring to the nitty gritty of what all the decisions that have already been made by the elementary school building committee in terms of tile and carpet and paint and all that stuff. What I'm talking about is we have like a three week period of time yeah. where there's work to be done. Right. And that work wasn't the charge of the elementary school building committee. So that's the work I was talking about. Well, I, I mean, separate. it's true. it's clearly a team effort. I don't, I, I just, whomever. I my, my point more is somebody needs to have a conversation with the appropriations committee. Somebody needs to have a conversation with the CIC yeah. all of those things if they're not already on the timeline to get us between here and January the 6th. vote at special town meeting we need to just make sure that they get added in that was all anyone else have any questions comments okay. thank you Jeff thank you thank you Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
just, just a question. So the, the consideration that we're looking at here is, is actually two million, not three million that's printed in the materials. We are going to be amending the warrant. Just but you're right, Nancy. That yeah, was right. old. Yeah. greatly updated information as of tonight. It was three million yesterday. Yeah. It was. <laughs> we put out a higher number on Monday until I got all the feedback from. That's great. The Wait till tomorrow. I maybe you'll get it down that. to one. Have a good night. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I and you know, in the um, Jeff, if, sorry, if you could not leave until sure. after we've voted the uh, wording on the Warren article, because I think you've been very much involved in that conversation as sure. well. Yep. If that's okay, Lori. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I am. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that the liaison reports are going to be minimal, based on the fact that two of our largest liaisons uh, were just kicked off in the beginning of our reports. But if anyone had any other meetings, I know Jean. The, the other big we're going to talk about later. later. Yeah, so um, I had no meetings over the break, and Kelly, I don't know if you had anything. Nope. Either. I, I have two next week, uh, so I'll have more yeah. to report so we'll, next time. We'll, we'll catch up the liaison reports at the next meeting. Five minutes back. Um, as for the chair report, um, before I get into the naming facility timeline, I just wanted to speak to a meeting I was at last evening. Um, not Clear on whether everyone was invited. I think you all were invited to the open meeting law um, meeting that was held by the town. Um, Mr. Kamala was uh, ran it with um, our town council and it was quite quite a crowd. Um, I think there was a representative from most every committee and some committees I had never heard of within town. So um, talking about all the various points of open meeting law, things that people had been doing in the past, questions, updates, things of that nature. So just wanted to make you aware of a couple things that I jotted down that were news to me. Um, and um, and if, we, if you want copies of any of the materials that were provided, I'm sure that Mr. Kamalo has extras for the rest of the group. Um, and I certainly could also have them copied and provided to you guys as well. Um, so the one, <laughs> The one interesting point that Ray brought up um, was that he warned all committees not to put into your bylaws or run your meetings in accordance with Robert's rules, um, which was news to me um, because of the fact that Robert's rules is so dense and complicated that committees run afoul of um, accidentally breaking a rule in how they transact business, tran you know, transact their business. So the recommendation was that the chair of every committee run their meetings in an, in order to transact the business, <coughs> and that was the only requirement, that it be run in a reasonable and orderly fashion. Um, so it, not to say that we're <laughs> throw out all formality of our meetings by any stretch, but I think it just, it, it helped me understand a bit more too that the conversational style that we have adopted over the past couple of years is also not inappropriate. Um, and also that we're not risking running afoul of Robert's rules. So I just wanted to put that out there. There still are rules we need to abide by and especially school committees are um, regulated by state law. So there are things for us to pay attention to but that was just one point I wanted to bring up. Um, the other change was that in public records requests, instead of 10 calendar days, we now have 10 business days. Um, so there is a change there to respond. Um, there also was the recommendation by town council that our executive session minutes that we had voted not to release should be reviewed every three months. Um, and so I don't think that we have been reviewing in that um, cadence, so I think that we need to review our timelines and, and look to update that. Um, and that what was interesting to me also, because I asked this question specifically, was that I, I was under the impression that personnel related matters would always remain um, unreleased, and that was not the case. If there has been a resolution on a personnel matter, um, or a contract signed or litigation that's ended, they do get released. So the only, the only absolute that we are given by town council on that was um, anything related to healthcare. 
like health records or medical records. So those are the big updates I wanted to give you. There um, certainly was more information provided at the meeting, but I um, wanted you to be aware of those particular things. Obviously, Jean was there, um, and it was a huge, it was a huge crowd. Um, so moving on to the other areas of my report. So we have the, well, we have to name this building that we're building, no matter what size it's going to be. <laughs> So I wanted to go over with you, which was in the agenda materials. We we had already looked at our policy um, letter FF earlier in the year and had agreed that we were not making any changes. So in light of that, um, our timeline for naming the new building is guided by that policy. And so we have a timeline listed here. Dr. McLeod. When you and I talked, were we anticipating me reading through this? Um, I think it, they've been, they've reviewed it, so no, I don't think you were going to. Okay. I just didn't know from a public standpoint. Oh. Um, I can give some highlights of mm -hmm. this, but um, certainly we will be putting out more public notices so that everyone in town will have the opportunity to take part if they um, feel so inclined. But basically that our policy expects an orderly and an announced procedure. Um, to lessen any community or factional pressures. And so today would be January 5th. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at that being the start of the timeline. So 60 days prior to us having our naming um, would be the public announcement of our intent to name, which is made at our regular school committee meeting, which is what we are doing now. Um, and then we will be, as of tomorrow, Dr. McLeod will be um, issuing news releases to local news media announcing the intent for us to name the facility and inviting the members of the committee to suggest names by either writing to Dr. McLeod directly or appearing at any of um, the next school regular school committee meeting, which is January 19th. Um, that at our next meeting, which would be following the initial announcement, um, any members of the community can appear before us and have the opportunity to present their suggestions at the meeting, or again, they can provide them to Dr. McLeod directly, either via whatever means of communication they choose to use. Um, at the second regular meeting following the announcement, which is actually February 2nd, um, our first regular meeting in February, Dr. McLeod will present to all of us a list of the names that have been suggested um, along with Dr. McLeod's recommendation. And then in Mar on March 2nd, a month later, the official naming, which is the 60-day mark from today, will occur. Um, and then there are specific procedures to follow for the naming request, which I believe will be included in the press release from Dr. McLeod so that the community is aware of what those procedures are. Um, for anyone who is watching tonight, all of this is in our agenda materials and will be posted um, um, in great detail. Um, but certainly, if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself or Dr. McLeod and we can point you in the right direction. Um, I wanted to give the committee an opportunity to ask any questions or raise any concerns now if you have any. Um, but I know that we went through this policy in detail earlier this year. I don't have any concerns. I'm excited to see what people submit. I just, um, when, when we send out the information, can we make sure to include at least a link to the policy that gives all the Definitely. requirements? Or could it even be like a fillable form with specific instructions so people, so that it, we kind of lead them through it and set them up for success? I don't know. Do you mean a fillable form, Jean, that follows these naming request procedures that are called out in this document? Yeah, just to make I, it easier I can't for have people? that ready for tomorrow, but no. I can certainly have that happen. However, yep. it's easy. You I know, mean, I can technology have the press released. release by tomorrow when the announcement with the fillable form to follow, yeah. if that's... It, we don't have to do it. I just thought no, that I think might it's be a good easy. idea. I, I mean, know. it's nice to have consistency, right, when you're reviewing something. Yeah. Because you can be you can be really affected by the application itself. Are we inviting students? I, I was thinking there might be high school students that would take an interest in this to be part of the process. Okay. 
None in particular. Just I think what I mean, my understanding, Dr. McLeod, when we had talked about this, the news outlets were one avenue and then also our listservs and um, would be receiving them as well. So the students should see it through there. Um, but what's interesting is we did learn about the new Hopkinton newspaper, so we can see if they're up and running, you know, the high school newspaper, right. oh, and yeah. see if they're up and running and want to publish it. Um, but certainly, I would think that through the listserv that they would be aware as well, although it's too bad our student council members have already left the building. Um, they also have a news broadcast, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Although I'd actually really like to know what the kindergartners would name it. I know. <laughs> Interesting, too. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it. right. <laughs> okay, so if there are no other questions or comments, thank you for that suggestion, Jean. Um, then we can move on to the next item, which is our budget public hearing, which is Monday, right? Tuesday? Yes, Monday. Monday. Um, I'm losing days, which is January 9th. It will be here at 7 p.m. Um, we invite any and all members of the public to come and join us um, and voice your opinion on the budget that we uh, discussed at length all through the end of November, beginning in all of December. Um, that's all there is to really mention about that. And then we will be taking our vote on the budget that evening. And depending on how the vote goes out, we will be submitting our budget to the town the next day the next day all right that's all you need to hear from me tonight which is a lot more than normal so I can turn over you to dr. McLeod and um, really we've covered the what, what what was the most important piece for me tonight under reports was was what we've just done um, with Jeff and, and as well with Dawn um, but in addition um, in our work with NESDEC in another capacity around our Director of Operations, our Director of Finance and Operations search, um, at the recommendation of NESDEC, um, we have amended the timeline. Um, applicants who had already applied within the earlier guidelines have been all um, notified of the change of guidelines, just in case they were kind of wondering why they haven't been uh, notified. And people on the committee, the screening committee, the um, the um, interview committee, they've also been notified of all of these changes in these dates. Um, so that um, our goal will be to have finalist interviews with the school committee at our Thursday, March 16th meeting um, with an announcement of and the beginning of contract negotiations the following day, the 17th. Um, I'm certainly comfortable with the change in the timeline. I don't think it's not at all concerned that it's going to affect our pool. Um, it did feel that you know, given given the uh, process that we were going through with NESDIC, it was it was feeling rushed. So, Carolyn Berg did um, compile all of the information that was uh, that was a result of the meeting that she had and has shared that with the committee. Um, so, around the candidate profile, and we will use that when we meet with Carolyn next to develop the questions um, for the interview process. So it's in your packet, it's it's out there as well for the community, but I just wanted to make sure that I brought it to your attention. Um, we're in good shape, and Kim is working collaboratively, of course, as you would expect, with NESDEC um, on this search. Right, and that is all I have tonight, Lori. Perfect. All right, we will move on to new business, which our first item of new business is to um, consider the special town meeting warrant article, Dr. McLeod. Yeah, and, and Jeff, I can use your help on this. So I know um, given the timeline and given all of the uh, situations that John, you know, you, you summarize all these things happening at the same time, um, I had been asked to reach out to see whether or not we could even it would be even appropriate to um, ask that a an article be included for this purpose. Um, and in those conversations back and forth, um, it was recommended that I reach out to town council on the wording of the warrant, um, which resulted in some conversations. I then reached out to Tim and Jeff um, around that piece of it, and there was also some 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 interaction with the MSBA. So the wording that is in front of you has been approved by town council, um, recommended by town council, 
and my understanding from all of the back and forth was that approved also uh, or recommended um, by you, Compass as being what, what exactly it is that we're looking for. Yeah, we, we, we think this is what they'd be looking for. We've submitted it to the MSBA's town MSBA's council, and we're waiting on their final uh, comments back. But this is in line with other types of language they've approved in the past. And we, you know, just if you can explain it better than I, but we wanted to make sure in reaching out to the MSBA and to their council that we were not doing anything that could have a negative impact on our partnership in within the current project with them, and that they were fully aware that we were having this conversation. Right. Is that right? You know, from a from a starting standpoint with the MSBA, because we're the one trying to renegotiate the deal, we're going, we're entering into it assuming that the town would pay the full share, what the addition is, because we're already over the caps anyway. So that two million savings was two million you guys were paying anyway. That portion of it, you know, the cream at the top, if you will, was the, strictly on the town side. You get down lower, that's when you get to the shared portions of the project. So of that four, you were already paying for two of it anyway. So we weren't going in assuming automatically we're going to get a handout from the MSBA. That's part of the negotiation. So the, the language here uh, talks about um, maximum eligible determination by the MSBA. So basically, if they determine nothing additional is eligible, you would uh, support the entirety of the additional cost. Um, so Dr. McLeod, in light of also what Nancy had just raised a few minutes ago. Yep. Um, I mean, what we're considering here and what we had just earlier discussed is submitting a warrant article for special town meeting. What we are originally, and obviously the numbers have been changing, um, <coughs> what we were originally going to be including was a not to exceed three million um, for the four additional classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point in time, it seems that the comfort level is with $2 million, yes. so we could adjust the motion that's here to say not to exceed $2 million, and would the committee be comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. um, but this is what we're approving, is... No. Sorry. Well... This is the, the warrant article. Right. Go ahead and say that. And the number... It's on page. Um, so not in the warrant article. So, but yeah. when we say move to approve the warrant article, this wording, which has been vetted by legal, With, without dollars, he without didn't dollars. include any dollars, right? Because right. the, the warrant article wouldn't include dollars. The motion, right? The right. So the motion will dollars, include right. dollars, but right. this is what right. we're approving from a right. language. Right. Perspective. And so, okay. what I would propose adding. So, if I was going to write the motion currently in our agenda materials, not the warrant article, I would state that we are approving a special town meeting warrant article as provided to you during tonight's meeting, not to exceed $3 million to include a four classroom addition to the current building project and associated redesign. So I have two questions. One is, I understand that um, there's a two million dollar savings that's potentially an offset, but the current price that you're talking about for the addition is four million. So I don't know if the motion needs to be. I asked this question earlier and was told no. Okay. <laughs> so it's a good question because I asked the same one, um, but it. Because we're really authorizing four million dollars, because otherwise right. we have two million dollars that the town asked isn't going to spend. Town council at this point. We asked the question. But well, we don't need to. We don't need to appropriate because I asked that. I think we've all asked this question at some point in the conversation, right? We don't need to appropriate the four million dollars because per town council, if I understand it correctly, the we can by making this addition, we can spend that two million dollars as part of this addition. So we only need the delta. Is all we'll need to appropriate. Okay. Um, no, I get that that's all we need to appropriate. I just didn't know if this was referring to the price of the addition versus the price of the additional appropriation. So that was oh, my... Mean. Or the price of additional appropriation. Okay. So that's my number yep. one question. My number two question is, I mean, I think we're lucky that we had a, a posted meeting scheduled in this time frame five minutes before the deadline for the warrant. But I don't know that the Board of Selectmen has had the opportunity to discuss this or the building committee. So can we also include in the motion, like pending the agreement of the Board of Selectmen and um, 
and the building committee, I assume that they are going to vote on whether or not this warrant article should, would this what request should be made at special town meeting. Um, they're probably not going to meet before tomorrow. No, they, yeah, no, it can always to, come this off. This likely going to have to approve the warrant anyway, right? Okay. Well, I guess I'm just trying to make sure that everybody, you know, that we're being respectful of the building committee and the board of selectmen's roles in the in the process. So if we don't need to adjust it, that's fine. I just I just asked the question. I'm not the one that talked to town council. Mr. Her, you wanted to comment. So if I could say a couple sure. of things. Um, one, special town meeting was originally set up really for one purpose. We were trying to message to everybody we wanted just one purpose, and that was the charter review process. Um, but I've, you know, I've seen what you guys are dealing with here now. Uh, in, re in reality, though, the, the, the special town meeting warrant is open, mm -hmm. and people can go submit articles to get on that warrant. And then we vote to close the warrant, and then we go from there. So you don't need our approval to do what you're considering doing to get on the special town meeting warrant. Uh, we'll talk about, so we were talking about a minute ago, you know, I'll go Tuesday night uh, and during liaison reports talk about all this and explain what's going on. But we don't really have to vote what you guys are going to vote. It's, it's your call. You know, so I think in that regard it would be okay. Well, that was my question because originally when the building committee was set up, that had to be done by the Board of Selectmen. I just want to make sure we're thinking about everybody's role in this process because of the MSBA requirements and how they had us construct it in the first place. I just want to make sure that we're inclusive of everybody's role. I know that we can put it on the warrant um, ourselves. I get that, and we can certainly take it off. I'm just wondering for the purposes of this motion, which is not the warrant language, if there's any value to... I'm just trying to be respectful of your committees. Uh, I, I That's all. That. I, I think it's going to be fine. I mean, it is what it is. That's kind of what Norman and I were talking about a few minutes ago. This is not ideal, but it is what it is. I think in terms of the specific question of what you have to vote, from my understanding of it, or with my understanding of it you have, you've been appropriated $40 million, whatever it was, right? Now you need 42 because you've got two of your 40 still sitting around. Mm -hmm. So you just have to go for another $2 million, and that's it. But we haven't been appropriated that. The building committee has been appropriated that. Under the direction of the school, school committee? No. The, it's, the, it's the sponsor listed here is the elementary school building committee. Yeah. And, the, and the money is, as in the, in the original motion, is being spent under, under the direction of the building committee. We are not approving That's correct. the expenses. They are. I still think that that can get handled at the town meeting, so the motion. Okay. So why don't, Jean, just for comfort, um, we just state that we're, I mean, this is not the motion yet. We can still work on it because, trust me, I will, I will not do a good job the first time. Um, we'll move to approve a special town meeting warrant article not to exceed the $2 million in addition to the already appropriated monies for the elementary school building project, which would include four additional classrooms to the current building project and associated redesign. I will have to do that again, and we may even need to use a tape recorder, but that was generally going for what you're getting at. And I don't disagree, because I was very confused by it when we were talking about this initially, which is why I said to Dr. McLeod, I really want to check with town council on this because really we're talking about an additional sum of at the time was five now it's four and we don't have control over that money so i agree um so if anyone has a better way of wordsmithing this please <laughs> help me out but if not then i think that we can move forward with that as long as no one has any other discussion points i have but just a question laurie sure and it came to gene's point about the sponsor which I had just not noticed until you called it out. So if we are not, the, if you are not the sponsor, but the ESBC is the sponsor, and we are placing, we are requesting the warrant to Mr. Her's point, how can we request a warrant item article on the part of the ESBC if they're the sponsor? And I think that's what. No, but we're requesting a warrant article the for the two million dollars. 
Do you want Joe to talk or no? Why what? The sponsor of the building. The ESVC. They, they have the spending authority, but were they the sponsor of the article? The spot. I think what we're the approved? sponsor, the ESBC spends the money. Right. So I think the issue here is the sponsor on this draft is wrong. It should be the school committee, and it should be spent under the direction of the elementary school building committee. And then we do all those, then we, then we take care of all those concerns about, exactly, that's why that's I was asking. I wanted to confirm that that's what the, I almost tried, I tried to pull it up, but I couldn't find it, is that that's the way the school article works. So we're the sponsoring entity but it's spent under the direction of the ESBC okay so does that need to be added then to the language the uh, uh, the motion will have the spending authority. Yeah, the motion okay oh. we just have to change the spot the sponsor needs to change so we'll, we'll change the sponsor okay. Okay. sponsors amended thank you okay. As amended. okay thank you all right I gotta rewrite so this and I think we're crisis all. averted all right good now I know how laws in the Senate and Congress <laughs> look horrible because everyone writes this stuff on the fly um, all right. What did I say before? It was great. <laughs> great. Did you so get it, Nancy? So oh, yes. so not to so so <laughs> I'm going to do it again. So We're going to try for it again. All right. I am seeking a motion to approve the amended special town meeting warrant article not to exceed $2 million to include a four classroom addition to the current building project and associated redesign. I think that's it. Is this amended? Well, yes. we're going to amend the sponsor. Oh, just amend the yeah. sponsor. Sorry. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano is seconded by Ms. Kavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so Excellent. carries. Thank you, Mr. Rico. Sorry you had to suffer through that. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Thanks so much. All right. We are removing our budget transfer item B, and we are moving on to our item C, which is the Capital Project School Department Article Warrant number 17-042 in the amount of $70,294.92. Mr. Dumas. Sure. Uh, there is one Capital Warrant article uh, that is made up of five invoices. Uh, the largest is to advance lighting and production services for upgrades to the middle school auditorium. Uh, that project was appropriated as Article 24 at the May of 2016 town meeting. That's for 66364 And the rest of the capital warrant is all related to um, system-wide security upgrades as appropriated in Article 13E of the May 2016 annual town meeting. And the superintendent and I recommend that these items be approved for payment by the school committee. Anyone have any questions? Any comments on the motion? All the numbers matching? All right. All right, at this time I would seek a motion to approve the payment of warrant article 17-042 in the amount of $70,294.92 to the vendors as outlined in the agenda materials. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, seconded by Mrs. Kavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And was there one abstention? Or no, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I just misheard everybody. Um, it's unanimous and so carries. Okay, I'll see you. I'll see you in my head. All right. And on to. We lost our yeah, whole audience. Seriously. Now Ralph's leaving. I know, right? Come on up. Pam's yeah. having it. <laughs> you don't sit in the back row, Pam. <laughs> And we're on to item D, request for endorsement of the town charter. Now you get to do your liaison report while you're doing that? Uh, I'm going to let Pam do it. <laughs> <laughs> There's one for everybody. So thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to provide a brief background, although I'm sure Jean has done a great job keeping you all up to date on it along with our progress and, and what's going on and ultimately leading to what's changed for in the charter for the school committee. So every 10 years, Hawkington's charter calls for a review of the charter and for the special committee formed to complete this review to make a report with recommendations to the town meeting. The committee conducted interviews and sent questionnaires to town officials, boards, and committees seeking input. We held two public forums this fall to obtain input from the community at large 
We also investigated benchmark communities for comparison purposes. The goal of all proposed changes to Hopkinton's town charter is to streamline town government, to make board and committee structure more consistent, and to enable an efficient and effective town government capable of meeting evolving responsibilities and demands. The proposed amendments to the original town charter created in 2006 fall into the following categories. One, editorial changes, including reorganization, additions, deletions, and clarifications. Two, changes to the annual budget process. Three, updates to the reporting structure for town employees who report to and or work with town boards or committees. And four, a recommendation to change the position of town clerk from an elected to an appointed position. All proposed changes are the result of months of research, discussion, review, and comparison to the selected benchmark communities, as well as input and feedback from residents, town officials, boards, and committees. We realize that our opinions are not necessarily in alignment with those of the majority of the people we've encountered through the public forum process, but after examining the data from these, those forums, as well as information and data gathered through other means, these are the recommendations we present. All proposed amendments were unanimously voted by the Charter Review Committee. So I th probably what's easiest and, and what you have in front of you is if I take you through everything in the old charter or the new charter that says school or school committee in it, and I've provided a summary of it. So Article 2, Section 2.6, which is initiation of warrant articles, it remains the same in terms of who may file a warrant petition, i.e. any department head, any board or committee acting by a majority of its members and a citizen's petition. The committee recommends a change in the deadline for the receipt of a petition for annual town meeting from 60 days before annual town meeting to 90 days, and primarily to line up better with when budgets are due. It, do you want to ask questions by change or you want to wait till the end? Um, do you want to go by change? Any preference? Okay, any questions on this particular change? Okay. This isn't a substantive change for like a committee like ours because typically mm -hmm. ours are in well before that 60 days anyway. This is Correct. more driven towards It's just sort of tightening right? everything okay. up a little bit better. Yep. Um, in Articles 3 and 6 of the proposed charter where the town manager is given power, a power or duty such as goal setting, supervision, evaluation, discipline, <laughs> fixing compensation and creation of administrative orders, the school department is specifically excluded from the town manager's purview, which means you guys are on your own. <laughs> <laughs> but was that, I mean, what's the change? I guess? Not well, we've change. added new um, portions in the town manager role, and within those descriptions, we said, except for the school department. Got it. Article 3, Section 3-4, the Department of Public Works, is an incorporation into the charter of the 1998, 2006, and 2010 DPW Special Acts that were approved at annual town meetings and by the state legislature. There have been no changes from the Special Acts as they relate to the school committee or the school department. And that was basically that the DPW will take care of your roadways, but that you're responsible for the maintenance in the schools. Article 4, Section 4.1, the school committee, remains substantively the same as the current charter. And you've got a page that shows the original charter, the second page that I gave you, the original charter, what it says for the school committee, and the proposed charter, what it says. We, we You're going to trust us. us. I know, but we all, well, no, we all have read this a couple times, so. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, Article 7, Section 7-2, Submission of a Budget, removes the dates for deliverables from the charter, except for the establishment and issuance of the budget schedule by the town manager, lo no later than October 1st. The budget schedule must be agreed to by the Board of Selectmen, School Committee, and Appropriation Committee. This allows more flexibility for meeting the ultimate deadline of annual town meeting, but at the same time ensures deliverables can be met on an annual basis. I would say this is the biggest change that affects us, but this is one that I brought to you before we made it, and so I think we're all comfortable with okay. this one. Article 7, 7 Section 7-3, Capital Improvements, provides for a more comprehensive 10-year plan 
The capital improvements program shall be designed to address unmet long-range needs and implement the capital goals and objectives of the town and shall include all town activities, all town departments, including the school department, and all enterprise funds. The plan shall include cost estimates, potential methods of financing, and recommended time schedules for each improvement, as well as the estimated annual cost of operating and maintaining each facility and item of major equipment involved. The committee understands that this is a guideline and issues may arise that would require changes between annual reviews of the plan. And I just would like to point out on this, you still have the right to initiate your own warrant article. So while this provides a comprehensive view for the entire town, it's not taking away anybody's ability to put something out there when they say, my boiler broke and I need to get a new one. So I have a question on this one. Actually, yep. this is a question I popped up when I was reading this, uh, the, the charter yesterday. I'm glad you highlighted this. So does this substantively change the capital improvement committee structure? has nothing to do with the Capital Improvement okay, so, Committee. So that flow is still going to be the same in that any Warren article we have is still going to be... Correct. I need to be approved by... Okay, because that... That's I, that in was the, the town bylaws. It, when this so. seemed like a change, I wasn't sure if that was impacting that at all. Okay, cool. No. Thank you. The charter is oddly silent on the Capital Improvements Committee. They yeah, are, it is. They are... <laughs> I didn't know if that was intentional it, it, No, yeah. and it, it, the current one yeah. is like that, and, and our revision is, is substantially the same. It's in the bylaws, as, as Pam said. And so I think the only thing to note here is that it's actually the town manager's responsibility to um, make this presentation to the Board of Selectmen annually. So he'll be yeah. working with capital improvements and camp and whatever, however he does it. Because okay. yeah. that was Good the genesis him, of my question, because it does call out the town manager exactly. and it calls it the capital improvement plan, and there is no mention of CIC in the charter anywhere. So. Right. But, but they've got a significant section in the bylaws. In the if, okay. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't right. impinge in any way on our Great. ability to forward okay. our articles right thank you yep article 8 section 8.8-2 8 periodic charter review has been amended to reflect the committee's experience with the review process both in terms of how committee members are selected and the timing of the formation of the committee the school committee shall appoint <coughs> one member to the special committee as will the board of selectmen and the appropriation committee the remaining four members of the special committee will be appointed by a committee consisting of one designee each of the Board of Selectmen, the School Committee, the Appropriation Committee, the Town Moderator, and the Town Clerk. The timing will be once every 10 years from the last report made from on the Charter to Town Meeting. And the Special Committee will be established no later than the year preceding the due date to the next report. So currently, and it still is not, I mean, it's a lot clearer now, but Current, the current charter, the school committee has one designee onto the charter committee. This next time, the school committee will still have one designee, but it will actually be a designated, it can either be the school committee member or somebody who has been designated by the school committee to serve with their knowledge. And then they will also be part of this five member per committee set up to choose the remaining four members. So that's all right. Any questions pop up on other sections as we went through the remaining sections? <laughs> Kelly, you just gave me a look like now I feel like I have to come up with a question. The thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, anything, well, Nancy? Yeah, okay. You're supposed to. Thank you so much, Pam, because this was very concise and helpful. That, that's the goal. Um, all right, and I know that you had provided us a motion that's in our agenda. Yeah, so just so you know, Pam is like doing a road show to every board and committee that's impacted by the You're changes. You're number three, I'm getting better. To the, um, <laughs> to, the, to the charter, because the goal is to go to special town meeting with the endorsement of the committees most, most impacted, but I do want to take the As opportunity. As it relates to those committees. Right, I do want to take the opportunity since we're on TV to say thank you to Pam because she has put an unaccountable number of hours into this committee and um, really you can see how organized and efficient she is. It's We owe her a big debt um, of gratitude, so thank you very much. We should have asked you more questions so you could be prepared for your other committees. I can do I, it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't stump her. memorized. You could probably ask her page numbers. <laughs> All right. I did, somebody did try to stump me with that. I'm like, oh, no, it's section blah, blah, blah. Oh, my oh, God. That's really sad. Yeah. Can you recite <laughs> yeah. the whole charter now? Impressive is the right word.
Um, all right. So I would seek a motion to vote to endorse the revisions of the Town of Hopkinton's Home Rule Charter proposed by the Charter Review Committee to the extent that such revisions relate to the school committee and school department and as set forth in the draft proposed charter provided by the Charter Review Committee and as in our agenda materials. So moved. Second. Motion by Mrs. Birchman, seconded by Mrs. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. Yes, and it's unanimous and so carries. Thank you, Thank Pam. You. Thank you, Pam. Do you need an electronic of this or no? Would you like an electronic for the minutes of the report that I just um, spilled out? Yeah, that would probably yeah, be helpful. Probably. Also okay. for Megan to I'll send, post it. So. I'll send it to Megan and, and Dr. Super Cloud. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Now we're down to no See, now audience participation. Guess as to how second public comment's going to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there could be an in influx at in the last second. <laughs> so could be watching. we have letter E, school committee policy, KE, school related problems and concerns, and it's up for our first reading, Dr. McLeod. Thank you. I'll bring your attention to the red line version, <clears throat> but basically this um, had been on our, on our list to review, but it also came to my attention in response to a concern that was brought to the school committee. And in reviewing the policy, um, I realized that some of the things were no longer the way we are doing business. So I wanted to bring it up for your consideration. Um, and if, if we really could really begin, um, it probably makes sense. I've, I've obviously, you've had this in your packet, um, and I reviewed the entire uh, policy, it, nothing has changed in my opinion on the first page, but when we look under my, under superintendent, um, I've added school committee meeting and agenda items question mark because, um, so superintendent, if the parent believes that the problem is not resolved at the principal level, the parent may contact the office of the superintendent for guidance or resolution. Issues brought to the superintendent may include. Um, under school committee, we have, we've called out school committee meeting and agenda items. Um, sometimes those are brought to my attention where somebody would say, you know, is this something that you, you would be willing to talk to the chair to add? And it, it sometimes comes from other committees like, I mean, like the ESBC, like tonight's meeting when, where we were talking about enrollment. Um, I don't know and it, whether or not it makes sense that all items on the agenda, because the practice that I've ever since I've been here is that the chair and I create the agenda jointly. Mm -hmm. So given that, um, I may be aware of something going on that the chair may not be, I would bring to the chair's attention, um, is this something that you would like to include on the next agenda? I don't know if it's useful to the school committee to have the superintendent also be um, in terms of somebody bringing their concern, that might that might then be considered for a school committee meeting I agenda item. So it's in there as a question mark. Maybe there's a reason why it hasn't been there in the past. I thought it was. The whole thing so kind of I reads like from a parent perspective. Yeah. Parent, parent. But it's happened. Like, remember when we had the homeschooling question? Yep. And then oh, we had to take okay. up. But it, it is in the original. Is. I just noticed that now. I just went and looked at that now because when I saw it in red, I thought, oh, is that an addition? But now I just am realizing it's already in there. So are you? Yeah, this wasn't redlined. Or oh. is this the new? No, but the, it's redlined as a question mark. Oh, so is do you want to keep it or remove it or not? Is that? Yeah. So whether or not, and so you're right, Kelly, and thank you for bringing me back to attention here. <clears throat> it's if the parent believes that the problem is not resolved at the principal level, da, 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 the parent may contact the office for guidance or resolution. Issues brought to the superintendent may include. So the question that I wanted us to deliberate was whether or not there would ever be a time, and you've just answered the question, when a parent would bring something to my attention that would result in me asking the chair if this should be brought. So that's a good example, Kelly. Uh, I think Kelly just said it, or Lori. Homeschooling. Sorry. Right. Oh, All right, no. so that, that would remain. Okay. okay. That does make sense. Okay. I was thinking, like, if you're talking about liaisons coming to you. Or so so yes, I, I, or yeah, I think it sense. should remain, but I'm not, uh, that example, though, isn't a school committee meeting or agenda item. That That's an application of a school committee policy or procedure. Yeah. 
I guess it got onto the agenda. It got onto the it agenda because it was an app a question of an application. I, I do. I mean, regardless, I think uh, you know as you talked so, about. but maybe you know, what you might be a better example is so we had like a, we had a public forum on um, recess and issues that were brought up during that public forum about using recess for discipline ended up being a parent issue. So I guess like, I mean, there's ways that it works, but I mean, I think it's awkward a little bit the way it's drafted, but I don't know how I would better. I think it's fine the way it is. I mean, absent, yeah, you know, absent an example, it's item. just if, if a parent has something, has a concern about a school committee meeting or agenda item, either something that is on there or they w request yeah. to be on there, I think it, okay. it's as appropriate that it come through you that it come through the, right. the school committee. I, okay. I think it, to your point, you do agenda planning with the chair, so I don't think it's, yeah. I don't think it's misplaced. Then, then maybe the reason I highlighted it now that I'm looking at this, under 4E, it says school committee minutes. And agenda items so would the school committee want to also include meetings see how it's called out under the superintendent but not under yeah the school committee should that say right. school committee meetings minutes and agenda items sure yeah Jean do you see where yeah. I am yeah I do <coughs> I guess that makes sense although I, I I'm, I'm just pausing because I'm thinking what does that mean, school committee I, I, meetings that's so separate if, from agenda so items? So if they look at the minutes they, online and they disagree that with something, then they would bring it up for minutes, and then meetings no, it would go on to... Well, I think it's most inclusive to just say school committee meeting minutes and agenda yeah, items. Yeah, I don't object categories. to it, but I'm just uh, yeah, I, trying I, to I agree with yeah. you. figure out for myself is, what's right. the difference between meeting and agenda items. My guess is there's, a, there's, a, there's a typo items. somewhere. Like, they're probably yeah. supposed to say the same thing. Yeah, yeah that's what I think. Yeah, okay. You could just take out and, meeting agenda items. So one go. that I added um, under B, under school committee B, for your consideration. The old wording was request that specific courses and programs be included in the program of studies. Um, I am wondering why that, and I'm sure there's some reason and some history, but why that would come to the school committee versus being a request that would come to the assistant superintendent who's responsible for curriculum and instruction. <coughs> Mm -hmm. I know that you approve, that the school committee approves the program of studies at the recommendation of the superintendent. Um, but I wonder about having the school committee be in, in the position, if that is the right body, to be in the position of approving or considering requests for specific courses or programs. Now, I, th I think one of the things we have to be careful of, though, here is is so so. I think it's in there for school committee, but it's also and again worded differently. It's also in under assistant superintendent, where it says suggestions or requests for change in curriculum. And so the point of this is supposed to. I think this policy is supposed to be, where do you go so if it's not down. resolved? So in the case of that, you'd start with the assistant superintendent, but it's giving you an example of. If not resolved at that level, it would go, it would continue forward, and examples of ones that would continue forward are that. So it would be the starting place as the assistant superintendent, but certainly if a, if a parent made a request and didn't feel resolution from the assistant superintendent and then subsequently the superintendent, it would come to us. Then, John, I, I understand that's a really good point, and thank you for, you know, re <coughs> th that, this is what we're talking about. We're yeah. talking about. However, then, there, uh, however, therefore, I believe it should be the exact same language. Yes. I was just going to say that. That's I think that's I that's yeah. probably what is is worth a review here. Is is the okay. language consistent yep. from level to level? Because I see those two yeah. things as being very different. Well, Potenti as, potentially, but it, I think maybe designed to be inclusive of each other, right? I I think what is currently assist under assistant superintendent A. I, I do think there's a difference between that and what is under B, under school committee. So I would say both should be under assistant superintendent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And but we also leave it where it is under but school But leave committee. it where it is under school committee. Because okay. I think the point of, part of the point of the school committee um, section is that not everything is in our purview. And so right. I think it's better to list what actually <clears throat> is. Um, yep. Because not everything is our beeswax. But, I mean, we can think about many examples of 
this very issue being brought to the assistant superintendent's attention, my attention, and then brought, being, yeah. So I think following the appropriate course right. and then bring, bring it to the school committee for, for consideration. So yep. does this also cover, and I know you and I had had a communication yeah. about um, tracking yeah. through programs yep. and study? Um, so I mean, like that was the change to curriculum, Kelly. That is where? Under change in the curriculum. That, um, that is where that would come up. That would come mm -hmm. up and... Okay. Because it's not really changing a curriculum, it's more of a... Placement. Well, that's a really good question. So Kelly's talking about the math accelerated conversations and decisions that were made pertaining to honors algebra. I mean... Yeah, algebra in grade seven, mm -hmm. and the changes that were made to the math program at the middle school. Mm -hmm. And over the course of my time here, there's been, there's been many changes made. So the question that's really important to consider is, does that get does that get elevated to you? Well, so this is exactly what is and is not in our purview. So yeah. the the curriculum and the progression of curriculum is in our purview because it's in the, the handbooks and, and program studies that we vote. If you're talking about did Johnny get into honors math, that is not in our purview. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so are we differentiating sure. the way we've called it out here? Do we feel comfortable that it differentiates that, that situation? So if we say request that specific courses and programs be included in the program of studies, um, and I'm just going to take a move to assistant because we're just going to copy there. Mm -hmm. um, but concerns or questions about, no, sorry, suggestions or requests for change in the curriculum or assessment <coughs> or questions about either, maybe we should call out placement so as well. So placement yeah. is an important word. Yeah. I think, yeah, placement is relevant to the assistant to superintendent. Okay. I would say changes us. in the curriculum should probably be included under school committee, but assessment isn't really, except for when, you know those times where we've had to make a decision, vote on MCAS versus Park or whatever, but in general, we don't select the assessments or we don't vote on, on that. So I would say you could take the first part of A under assistant superintendent and add that to the school committee because that is different than adding a specific course. It's talking about... Add A to the school committee? But only suggestions or requests for a change in the curriculum. Okay. And I will add under assistant superintendent the word placement. Yes, yeah, so you could yeah. have change in the curriculum. But placement should start with the, the principal so or the teacher. It does. Placement it does. starts with teacher, then it actually. Graduates oh, with okay. It starts with teacher and... Student is placement. actually in principal? Yeah, it's in teacher. It should be though. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, student placement student issues placement in a class program instructional level at the elementary schools the principal should be contacted. What about if I just take that sentence out because I think that it actually should be copied to the principal in all cases. Did you see the sentence under 1G? Uh, mm -hmm. I was looking to see if it was replicated. So just no. take that sentence out and instead copy G under principal? Yep. Mm-hmm. You're just taking out the parentheses. I, I was. Okay, and G is, but it's staying under teacher too. It is staying being under added, teacher and without being the parentheses. Added principal. Right, okay. Yep. But I'll bring this back to you. And then it would go to the assistant superintendent. Right. And then it would. And then it would go to the superintendent. And, and that us. would be the end of That'd it be because of we it. would not be weighing in on that okay. particular. Good. Okay. Should I continue? So I added the word department to be consistent with just the formatting. It just felt like, you know, we had the superintendent school committee and then student services, but then they call out the different positions within student services. So I just added the word department um, because this includes special ed, ELL. Um, I just changed the formatting for team chairs again to be consistent. It just felt like it was the way they set it up wasn't consistent with the way the rest of it was reading. So that's all that that is. Um, and then under concerns or questions about school safety or the crisis plan, now I've moved down to six, assistant superintendent. It was, when I, when I got here, it was very much the, the work of the assistant superintendent was responsible for the school safety. Um, 
and, and it obviously was the decision of a former superintendent. As superintendent, that's my number one priority, and I wanted to take that on. Um, so I chair that committee. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't need to be there any longer mm -hmm. because it really should be under superintendent. Concerns or questions about school safety or the crisis plan would come to me, and I guess the question would be, would it then come to you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that gets added under school committee as well. Okay, so they're not added currently, but they're going to be added? Right. Yeah, I'll bring, the, I'll bring this okay. back. Okay. okay. Then at the top of seven, um, I just made the comparison. So they're calling out that the athletic director oversees similar to classroom concerns. I just added going to the teacher. Any complaints about a sport should first go to the coach. Yep. I was just clarifying. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I added and operations to finance because I wanted to make sure that those concerns about buildings and grounds also came to that position going forward. Um, and then I just added student transportation, again, if not answered by the transportation coordinator. So people shouldn't be going directly to the director of operations about a transportation concern. They should first go to the transportation coordinator. And it is called out under that position. Um, and then I added under the director of finance and operations, maintenance and custodial concerns. Uh, we don't have an attendance office, sir. That falls under the responsibility. Um, we have policy that dictates concerns about attendance, numbers of absences that result in a letter and then a meeting, et cetera. So it happens first at the building level as dictated by school committee policy, um, but it then goes to our SRO. So I didn't think, because we don't have that position. It used to be, for some, it was a stipended position that Evan Bishop did back in the day. Um, and it's required a license. The attendance officer requires a, li a, a, a teaching li a license of some sort. Um, hmm. So obviously because we have an SRO and if it gets to the point where the attendance becomes a, a concern that has to be, that ends up in court, mm -hmm. then he would be the one that would go to court. And so he's our truant officer basically. Mm -hmm. So Not if it... Hmm? Not evident anymore. So can I ask a question though on the Director of Finance and Operations sure. because doesn't Buildings and Grounds not report up through Ralph anymore? They're currently reporting to me just because they're currently reporting to me. Um, but oh, when I thought we it was reporting to a show. show. The building. Oh. So I'll just answer the first part of the question first. As we look to seek a replacement for our Director of business and oper <coughs> finance and operations, or I think we're saying business, director of business and operations. No, fin finance. Um, we have, in our job description, included that the individual is responsible for operations. Mm -hmm. In reorganizing um, roles and responsibilities within the, within the office over the past few years, um, this has been something based on some concerns um, that I have taken on. Um, and then uh, Mr. Ghosh had been interested in increasing his areas of responsibility. However, once we decided that this position was not going to be a director of finance position alone, so that was, there was some conversation about should we be reorganizing central office? Um, would it make more sense to have a director of finance, finance and then a director of technology and operations? Um, and the more discussions and the more people that I spoke to in other districts, it never came to the point where I came to you to consider a reorganization because I, I, I really felt that the best replacement for, the, for what the <coughs> district needs and the deeper pool that we could get for applicants would be to, to replace Ralph with a director of finance and operations. So that reorg that I had talked about potentially happening um, and that I would have obviously come and we would have had a much more in-depth conversation um, before the search ever happened, didn't ever end up happening. Okay. So we're, we're business, we're, we're the way we've always done business. Um, I just got more involved in directly working with um, buildings and grounds over the past year or so. I guess my confusion was just over the fact that when we were dealing with the Boiler and some of those other issues and yep. talking about how we were going to change that. Yep. Mr. Ghosh was. He was. He did, he did step in um, for a period of time, I would say for September and October, 
And then the whole power school, it, it, he was just being so overwhelmed with everything that was going on with the new SIS migration and everything else. Um, and then at the same time, when we were looking, we didn't know that we'd also be replacing um, Mr. Rogers. So that happened kind of simultaneously, and it looked like, well, we're replacing both Mr. Dumas and Mr. Rogers. This is not a time to reorganize central office. Let's move ahead, replace those, those really critical positions. Um, and so Mr. Ghosh um, really at that point asked if he could pull back. In, in his responsibilities around that. Okay. So why don't I um, take all of your input and bring this back to the next meeting. Uh, I'll color code it so that we can all follow oh, it. Fun. Does that make sense? Did you say fun? For yeah. It? Okay. So but I know we... Uh, satisfying. I know you sent it out on listserv already. Yes. The first reading. Yes. Remind me our process. Do we send out the revised version? No. Mm -mm. We've been sending it out first to let people know we're taking it up and to give them an opportunity to give you any input to get for mm -hmm. consideration. Got it. Okay. Okay. And so. I have not received any input on, okay. on the policy other than all the work that Dr. McLeod has done. <laughs> all right. So we have no motion for that tonight, so we can move on to our intent to travel field mm -hmm. trip request. And this is a, an intent, so they will be bringing um, their final recommendation. They just wanted to be able to um, express their intent so that they could register. Um, the original is here, Lori, for your signature, should the school committee agree, but it is my recommendation that, that you would approve this request. Are there any questions about the trip or concerns? Any questions on the motion? All right. At this time, I would seek a motion to approve the initial overnight travel request for the girls varsity lacrosse team to travel to Martha's Vineyard on April 28, 2017, returning on April 29, 2017. So moved. Second. Motion by Mrs. Cavanaugh, seconded by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Yes, and it's unanimous, and so carries. And our one item for old business this evening is the community access to the athletic center before school, Dr. McLeod. Thank you. So the school committee, um, in reviewing policy KF, um, use of school facilities, and we reviewed and the policy was amended just September 2016. Um, when it got cold and the running club approached the school to want to come, as they always do, to run, it, it came up against our building access, our new, our, our changes to <coughs> security. And there were some concerns about people entering the building without being buzzed in, ways of recording it. But in addition to working with the secretaries at the high school, it also came to my attention that they had been signing this waiver um, and that people that were using the track on their own with no, without registering really, were signing a waiver. Um, and, and so my question was, well, where did the waiver come from? And there was kind of like, I don't really know, but the reason it's there is because unlike any other group that was seeking use of the facility, they would, they would have their insurance. They would have insurance. So it made sense that there was a waiver. However, I wanted to make sure that the waiver was legal and legitimate. So I um, forwarded it to Laurie, who, <laughs> who obviously couldn't weigh in legally, but said, you know, this, this kind of looks OK. But maybe let, let's just get it to our legal counsel so that if we're having people sign a waiver, at least we know that what, what they're signing is going to cover us from a legal perspective. Um, yeah, I, can I just add to that? Please, so, just pass these along. So I, I have had to do these in the private sector um, for gymnasiums in my company. I am not own. passing new information, just so everybody knows. Um, mm -hmm. I will but tell I, you what this is. The, the thing to realize with being a school district and and a municipal entity is that there's sovereign immunity there and so sometimes that has a different impact on these waivers and so I, that's why I was asking Dr. McLeod to ask our town council or not town council but our school council yep. to look at it yep. um, 
I did provide an, an example of a different one that I've used in the past, but just to see what they thought and if we need to make any changes. But it was funny because at first the conversation we had was, well, why, why is this different than anything else? But then when we realized that other uses of the buildings, the people have to show proof of insurance, and in this case, they don't. So that seemed to be the distinguishing factor here. So I just wanted to add that. So the reason uh, this is not new is that in your packet was the agreement, the current waiver. Mm -hmm. um, and the timeline was such that, like, two hours ago, uh, I received this, this information from Nancy, which is basically this waiver that's in your packet with her, the last page, the red line version, um, with, with her recommendations around the waiver. And I, cow. Yeah. And I, and I, <laughs> it's a little red. There's yeah, a lot of red. They bled um, over it. You know, I, my opinion is that we want to use a waiver, and if we've had our town, our legal counsel review it and make a recommendation, I, I'm fine with you that using whatever wa waiver they're recommending. Um, so that, that was part of, we didn't, have a mo uh, we didn't have a motion called out tonight because we didn't know if we would have this in time for your consideration. I was going to give you the background. Um, so before you vote, however, or before you take this up, um, there's a, there's a, Kelly brought to my attention that there's also an understanding, and, and sorry to put you on the spot, Jean, but you might not remember this, about also using the weight room. Hmm. It, during the original building configuration that they were going to be able to also use the weight room? Um, so I, I, I can't sit here and swear to what was said at town meeting 20 years ago. But <laughs> <laughs> however, I do know there have been times in the past where the rate, weight room was open to members of the public during certain hours because we had a staff member there in charge of the weight room like before school or whatever yes so that's the only thing that I remember about it so I suspect that when that staff member was no longer in place either for a budgetary reduction or you know whatever attrition and we didn't replace whatever um, that that probably is when that stopped. That would that would be my best guess okay. at the moment. Um, so I guess I would say, uh, do we have requests for people using the weight room? That well, I just had a neighbor who had said, I heard I can use the weight room. How does that work? So yeah, I don't know. I think that would be a question that I would want to ask Nancy Campany again or whoever did it, did it Paige. But... Um, the other question that this brings up for me, well, two things. Is the weight room in the athletic center? Yeah. Well, it's in that hallway, <laughs> right around, around the corner. Well, just because I, the way that they have this written was broadly for the athletic center. Although I, I don't disagree with you on asking the question because of the fact that I think the weight room is a far more dangerous, risky area for the district versus using a track. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Especially if they're using it alone. Right. Um, exactly. Um, so I think I have two questions. One is, it sounds like there already is a current practice of somebody collecting and tracking the waivers. I don't know. Yes, there is, Jean, and that and that has not been a problem. Um, we have a, we have basically an agreement um, because the building they used to come at six and yeah. we're not open until like ten after six, and it didn't make sense to me to pay someone to be here for the free use of the building. Right. Um, so. <laughs> You know, they're coming at 10 after 6. There is somebody there to buzz people in because I also didn't want the building wide open, which had been the practice. Building locked down um, so that people are buzzed in, and when they're buzzed in, they sign off. They sign in, they sign out, but we know who's there, and if it's someone that's new, they would, they would, it, it's not a lot of people. So somebody's already tracking. There's maybe 20 people, so don't. yeah, tracking the waivers. So not that's a good. Yes. So the other thing that this brings up is that this was uh, several years ago. I got a phone call from a very upset parent who's um, college athlete, college varsity level athlete. Yeah. Was home on vacation. Yeah. Track and field um, varsity college athlete, wanting to use the athletic center when it was already open for teams practicing, and was told no because of this whole insurance issue. Okay. Um, 
I was not aware that we had this practice in place at the time, and maybe we did or maybe we didn't. Um, so I pointed her in the direction of somebody that she could talk to, and yeah. I never heard back from her. And I'm only raising it because... I think that that probably happens on occasion, whether kids actually just come in and do their workout with their friends while their old coaches are around or yeah. not, and yeah. some, you know, ask permission or beg forgiveness kind of situation yeah. probably. So I just want to make sure that we've contemplated that that may be mm -hmm. um, either happening or something that people would like to happen. And I certainly think, it, it, you know, it falls under community use, and these are our kids that have graduated from here and our former athletes, so I, I would think that we would like it to be possible. I think the only thing that that raises for me, Jean, is that if it's happening during the, the hours of the school day, then they would need to be quarried. No, it would be, I, I, it's more, it's the, this particular um, request was more over the vacation oh, oh, when no athletic school. teams were here practicing oh, yeah. or the gym was open because right. teams were in and out practicing. It was not during the school yeah. day. Um, I think this, this would apply. Yeah. <coughs> so, but would I just want to. in and out? Yeah. Well, when teams are practicing, they, they must be buzzed in by their, by their coaches. Or is the building open? I mean. I think the buildings are open. Honestly, yeah. but I mean they have been, but we're really cracking but probably down. only that part because the rest of the buildings, oh, all the access the, to the, all of the hallways yes. would be locked. So see, they can come in that way, but in the case of the running club, we haven't been wanting to do it that way because then it means that somebody from the office, who should be up doing their work in the office, was Let's babysitting right. the athletic center. Okay. Yeah. So I guess my point is, I just want to make sure this would cover those students and that they would be somehow aware that it was an opportunity that was available to them and how they would go about yeah you know and and she calls out in this that there's also this also covers a parent signing for a minor right. as well so um, but the question uh, did you have a question John no. the question I have for the school committee that was just brought to my attention today from the office was there are members of this running club who do not live in our community it's a running club, right? It's cross-community. So we do have non-community members who are running on our track and signing this waiver. And I, I need to know, you know, if, if I mean, I understand, I, my understanding was that the being, having access to the track was part of the agreement in building the building that the community would have use of the facilities. So I don't know how that affects non-community members. It's a Hopkinton it's <coughs> running club, though, right? E even though they don't all live here, it is a Hopkinton community organization. I believe so. Yeah, I, I believe it is. And it also, at this point, doesn't sound like it's a problem either. I, I would think if it became a problem, then maybe we would like to, we would have to. Yeah, it's outside of school hours. Yeah. They're leaving before, and they are monitoring that. They know who signed in. They make sure that they're all out at 7 before the kids start arriving. I, I agree with what Jean said. I, I think okay, good. it's not an issue at the moment. I think we can continue. Great. Good. So this is all about before school. All before school. I was trying to figure out if there was any other times. No. Have, do we have to do something? I think I'm looking for a motion to amend the waiver um, that we've been using because we haven't really had an official waiver, John. Like this was kind of, when I asked for the history, it was kind of thrown together. Um, I think it came from Parks and Rec, but I think which we're is gonna, what Lou thought. So the problem here is that the waiver has never been referenced in the community use facility policy. So we would actually need to amend the policy to add the waiver and then <coughs> let's serve that. It is, it, wait a minute. It is referenced somewhere, just a minute. Because that's why I for. I think the application was referenced, but not the, not the. Oh, you know what? You're absolutely right, which is why when they asked me about the waiver to begin with, I said, well, where did the waiver come from? That's right. And I said, where is it referenced in the policy? And they said, well, it's not. And I said, well, then where did it come from? So that's where this whole circle happened. Maybe it doesn't need to be voted. Maybe I just now replace and accept that we have a new waiver, that liability waiver that we're using within so the district. here's the thing. We don't have to approve the procedures. Yeah, we just approved the, the policy. So let's add this to the procedures. And that way, if at a future time our legal counsel re recommends that we 
adjust it, then we don't have to right. go through a cumbersome and lengthy process to address. Because we reference in the policy the community use procedure handbook, so it could just be added to the to the reference procedure reference. Well, it doesn't have to be added in the policy. Just into the handbook. 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 Just that the policy itself lists the procedure handbook. So if we just add the waiver to the procedure handbook, then it doesn't need to amend Perfect. the policy. So okay. not to belabor the gym part, though, yep. the weight room part, if our terminology, so there's, there's a waiver for our students, it looks like, and there's a waiver for <coughs> non-students, so community members. Mm -hmm. So students are probably going to be using the weight room, but the policy, we don't think, or the waiver, will probably not cover the weight room for non-student community members. My Correct. guess is that the students, students don't use it on, on unsupervised. No, but this is a high school athletic center agreement and waiver. We, as the parents of, so is this only for before and after school or before school hours too? Because this, this seems is more only, like a general waiver. This is only waiver. for programs that have not gone through the building use, building and facility use okay. um, application so procedure and has their own insurance. So let's just clarify yep. that athletic center means track. That's what I was going to say. I, so it, it, as, as I've always understood it, the athletic center, as defined, is the is space of that gymnasium. Right here. Yeah. The weight yeah. room is close to it, but yep. that is not the athletic center. But we should center. be sure that we... That's what we call it, Kelly. Like, if we're having an event there, yeah. we always say it's taking place in the athletic center. Well, that big space. That's what... If we were looking at a map of this building, it would be labeled the athletic center. And the weight room is not accessible... I mean, I assume we no. keep that locked unless it's actually yep. in use by a supervised person. So again, I think that's one of those things where yeah. it's not like we're going to find somebody who signed this waiver wandering into the weight room and using it. Yeah. So, I mean, if we were to call this the gym, it wouldn't be accurate. That's the problem. And we can't really... Oh, call I was it. thinking more like the track, but... Well, but what you could say in the handbook is... Does not include weight does room. Does not include the weight room or yeah. the locker room. Just something that specifies okay. it, yeah. so yeah. that if community you don't members want say, in the locker rooms either. Yeah, you know, yeah. in there. I help build that building, and I get to use the weight room that you say. Okay. Actually, the policy says I'm going to add. Well, and, to, and if somebody wants to start a program where they rent the weight room at from okay. six ten to seven a.m. and supervise it, then that's a different discussion. But I don't think anybody goes in there unsupervised. Okay. Or, I mean, uh, unescorted alone. All right, so we vote. don't need to bring it back. We don't need to vote. Nice. We did leave you with some work, but. That's okay. <laughs> I've got it. I understand. All not, right. Not to include the weight room. Good. All right. So yep. we have our next opportunity for public comment for all of you in the public watching, and there's no one from the public here. Need a phone. So we are up. moving on to our items by consensus. <laughs> Only about eight minutes late. Isn't that great? Wow. The strong close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. And I apologize because I didn't ask ahead of time, but did anyone want to break anything out of the items by consensus? I was too eager. All right. Then I would take a motion as outlined by Dr. McLeod. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, seconded by Mrs. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous, and so carries. But this time, I would seek a motion to adjourn. So and I would oh. I'd like to thank um, I'd like to thank the um, custodians for the heat or the maintenance yes. department for the heat. It's warmer. So nice. We've like got three heaters. heaters. <laughs> so well, great. that's shooting at Lori. <laughs> <laughs> no. right, right there. So we tell. did seek a motion second. to adjourn. Oh, nice. There was a motion by who? Me. Mr. Graziano, seconded by Mrs. Birchman. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And we are adjourned at 9.36 p.m. for Nancy's benefit. Thank you. And our next meeting is Monday, January 9th at 7 p.m. here in the high school library, which is a special meeting and public hearing on our budget. We then also will have our next regular scheduled meeting on January 19th here in the high school library on January 19th at 7 p.m. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you.